Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to come to order. The Committee meets today to consider House Resolution 2309, the Postal Reform Act of 2011, House Resolution 3124, the Federal Advisory Committee Act uh, Amendments, let's see, Amendments of 2011, and Senate S-300, the Government Charge Card Abuse Prevention Act of 2011. Before I mark up, before I, I open uh, for the markup, I want to make sure everyone understands just one thing from a housekeeping standpoint. There are a number of committees that both sides sit on who do not have the ability to roll votes. As a result, we are very aware that members will be going in and out to meet votes in uh, T&I, Judiciary, and other committees. Uh, the intention is today we will go through the first and probably the, the longest markup, which will be the Postal Bill. We will roll votes until the end of that. At the end of that, we will have a series of recorded votes. At that point, we would advise all members to come back uh, for those rolled votes, and our intention is to get through the rest of the bills in a, in a fairly expeditious manner without rolling additional votes. We will roll additional votes only if it appears as though we are bogged down and we would be keeping people from other markups. Uh, I just want to make sure everyone understands that one of the advantages of this committee, quite frankly, is that we can allow you to come and go while guaranteeing that none of you will miss a vote. However, if, when you come back for that set of rolled votes, the expectation is we will not roll additional votes. We will get through the entire rest of the markup in perhaps 45 minutes or less, and people can be good for the day. Thank you. The committee will now consider House Resolution 2309, the Postal Reform Act of 2011, and I recognize myself for an opening statement. The problems facing the Postal Service are well known to this committee. Last fiscal year, the United States Postal Service lost nearly $10 billion. This year, they are likely to lose even more. Whether or not we believe that we could mitigate those by various changes in retirement. It is clear revenue is down. In August alone, revenue was down $1.4 billion, and expenses went up $700 million. Email is a reality. It is not a passing fad. Since 2006, mail volume has, is down more than 20 percent, roughly 46 billion pieces. The United States Postal Service cannot become a taxpayer-subsidized make-work program. To save the Postal Service, we must allow it to right-size its infrastructure to support the needs of the 21st century. Additionally, failing to act will not save the Post Office. It will doom the Post Office. Ultimately, delivering a, an effective product at an affordable price is the best way to save the many jobs we all know exist at the Post Office. H.R. 2309 is the only postal reform bill that returns the Postal Service to solvency and profitability. The bill enacts reforms that will save the Postal Service at least $10.7 billion a year and enable it to make even better business decisions, allowing them to reduce cost in line, in line with declining revenue. Labor costs, which is 80 percent of postal service expenses, have to be addressed in a serious postal reform. Our bill has a path to address the disproportionate amount of labor cost associated with postal services ex expenses without, and I repeat, without increasing the unemployment rolls. It is our preference that reductions in force occur among those who are fully eligible for retirement. Ultimately, though, this bill, as amended today, will make every effort to respect contracts entered into between the Postal Service and its collective bargaining units. However, United, USPS management has called for the ability to cut the workforce by 220,000 people in the next few years. Over the next four years, 250,000 postal workers will be eligible for full and immediate retirement. Our bill would prefer 
to thank them for their service and retain workers who have not yet reached full vesting in their retirement. If we do not act now, there will be enormous multibillion dollar taxpayer funded automatic bailout because the Treasury is on the hook. I repeat, the Treasury is required to pay by law Postal Service retirees benefits even if the Postal Service collapse. Taxpayers funded bailout proposals delay the inevitable. That is not going to happen under this watch either by Republicans or Democrats. We can either act now in a meaningful fashion or we can enact half measures. I have been on this committee for many years. I have voted for measures that were short-lived in their reform. It is my intention to make this a nonpartisan issue, to find every opportunity to work with both sides of the aisle, to be fair to legacy workers, but fair to the taxpayers, and most importantly, to make this continue to be an, a, a productive, efficient way to deliver universal service to every point in our 50 states and our territories. Before I yield to the ranking member, I want to thank him personally for the hard work that led to today's markup. I have no expectations that we have reached a final bill. I have expectations that we have been honest and candid up until late into the night on what we wanted to achieve, what we hope to achieve, and what we must achieve in order to bring this bill to the President's uh, desk for signature. So as we go through what will undoubtedly be a difficult and long markup, I want you to understand that our differences have been fairly vetted with each other, that in fact we are closer together than it may appear, and that I will continue working with the ranking member on a bipartisan bill, even if it is not fully achieved here today. With that, I recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. I want to thank the chairman for your statement and for particularly the last part of your statement. Um, I, too, am very anxious, as I have told you on several occasions to make sure that this is a bipartisan effort. Um, the Postal Service, but more importantly, the American people, expect for us to get this right. And I am convinced that if we cannot do this, none of us need to be here. This is so very, very important. It affects every single one of our constituents, businesses, commerce, and I can just simply say we can do this. We can get this done. In a paper entitled Postal Service Revenue Structure Facts and Future Possibilities issued on October 6, 2011, the Postal Service Inspector General identified the Postal Service's primary challenge, which is declining mail volumes, as the Chairman just talked about. The Inspector General stated, and I quote, the Postal Service's future financial health depends on its ability to cut costs and generate sufficient revenues to support its operations. In the past, volume growth paid for expansion of the delivery network. Now, with new digital technologies uh, are transforming the communications marketplace by delivering information instantaneously, regardless of distance, at a decreasing cost. Because of this profound change, postal services operate in a new business environment that simultaneously threatens traditional mail segments and creates novel opportunities. The Inspector General is clear that the Postal Service can meet this challenge. Again, I quote, just as other organizations have responded to volume declines in their core products and services, the Postal Service could benefit from an aggressive response. Ultimately, the path forward may require a new strategic direction that offers products and services that meet America's changing needs. I strongly believe that Congress should respond to this challenge by enabling the Postal Service to take this new strategic direction to ensure that it provides services American consumers want and need now and in years to come. By advancing the partisan legislation before us today, however, the majority appears to reject this path. Perhaps they even reject the idea that the Postal Service can innovate to meet changing market demands. But I am convinced that we can come together and work this out. The majority continues to believe that the Postal Service will inevitably require additional taxpayer funding, essentially a bailout. 
and that as a condition for this bill. The Postal Service should be placed under a control board that has the authority to break its existing contracts and take rights away from its workers. Let me be clear. We can ensure the Postal Service does not need a bailout if we act quickly and deliberately to develop bipartisan legislation that empowers the Postal Service to respond to its changing marketplace. The better path is the path that does not include a bailout, and that is the path that I believe the American public wants us to take. Finally, if we return the Postal Service fund, the funds, it is overpaid in the Federal Employee Retirement Service, the Postal Service will have sufficient bridge funding to pay employee retirement incentives, responsibly right-size its workforce, and meet its outstanding financial obligations. My Democratic colleagues and I will offer a number of amendments today that I hope are adopted. But the underlying bill offered by the majority is fatally flawed. I urge the committee to begin working immediately on a bipartisan basis to find, a, find thoughtful solutions to the Postal Service's challenges to capitalize on its many existing resources and, and advantages. And so, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you. Uh, with that, I yield back. I thank the Ranking Member. All members will have till the end of the day to place uh, their opening statements in the record. We will now open the bill, H.R. 2309, for consideration. Without objection, H.R. 2309 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed and is in folders at each of your desks. The, de the clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 2309. I believe I have the amendment in the nature of a substitute. We don't have the bill. This is the bill. Yes, that's correct. Am amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Mr. Ross of Florida. Okay. The amendment has been distributed, and without objection, the amendment will be considered as read uh, in the original text for uh, purposes of amendment. The gentleman, and I apologize for the confusion, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross, the chairman of the Subcommittee on Postal Service, is recognized to explain his amendment in the form of substitute for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A few weeks ago, the subcommittee I chair moved forward legislation that addresses head-on the challenges facing the United States Postal Service. It made a number of difficult decisions requiring the Postal Service to implement major reforms while giving the Postal Service leadership greater flexibility to operate like a business, the way it was originally intended to operate when it was created out of the old Post Office Department. Today's full committee business meeting moves this legislation another step forward. Today I am offering an amendment in the nature of the substitute to H.R. 2309, the Postal Reform Act. This legislation will create a receivership entity mandated to align Postal Service revenues and expenses extend a collateralized debt line to USPS that will ensure the mail continues to be delivered while reforms are being implemented, right-size and modernize the postal workforce and the physical infrastructure of post offices and processing facilities, and it will eliminate the number of unfunded mandates on USPS, including the requirement that it maintain a six-day mail delivery. Since the start of the 112th Congress, members of this committee have been intently focused on a finding a way to save the Postal Service. I have been personally encouraged by the number of stakeholders working toward the goal of ensuring a sustainable United States Postal Service. As the volume of first-class mail continues to decline and the product mix offered by the Postal Service continues to shift, the United States Postal Service must find ways to return to profitability by cutting costs and operating more like a private business. Over these many months, we have also heard from union officials and their allies who have consistently claimed that the Postal Service is owed $75 billion because of overpayments into the CSRS retirement funds. We know this to be false. Today, the GAO will issue a report explicitly recognizing that no overpayment exists. To be clear, the payment methodology used for the last 40 years is consistent with congressional intent. There is no overpayment. There is no error. There is no money owed to the Postal Service. Republicans in the House have consistently opposed any taxpayer bailout of the Postal Service. Short-term fixes that rely on taxpayer-funded bailouts will not save the Postal Service. Today's GAO report confirms, once and for all, the only way out of the U.S. Postal Service's current difficulty is to vastly restructure its operations, 
reducing the organization's workforce and labor costs, and provided the tools necessary to compete in the 21st century. We can no longer afford to postpone the Postal Service's day of reckoning by putting our collective heads in the sand and wishing away the problem. Doing so will only make a taxpayer bailout inevitable. The members here today are faced with a stark choice. Are we willing to make the hard decisions necessary to save the Postal Service, or will we let it crumble on our watch and potentially put this venerable institution at risk along with the jobs of the 8 million Americans who work in the mailing industry? While I wish this bill was not necessary, the status quo for the Postal Service is no longer sustainable, and the reforms in this bill are urgently needed if we are to preserve this valuable American institution. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, too, am looking forward to a productive discussion on the fate of the United States Postal Service this morning. As I have stated previously, the United States Postal Service is probably one of our most valued and reliable Federal Government entities. As one cornerstone of an overall trillion-dollar economic system, the United States Postal Service employs roughly 600,000 Americans that reliably process and deliver mail six days a week to over 150 million residences and businesses in every city, county, state, and U.S. territory. The contributions of the United States Postal Service to the fabric of our nation and our economy are undeniable. Therefore, ensuring its long-term solvency and profitability is critically important. While I am sure that some of the authors of H.R. 2309 share these concerns, I am equally certain that the approaches put forth in the underlying bill, the ISA bill, H.R. 2309, are not the most sensible policy reforms for modernizing the Postal Service for decades to come. For starters, and let's talk in, in plain terms here, this bill, H.R. 2309, the bill that the the chairman has offered, proposes a $10 billion taxpayer subsidized bailout for the Postal Service. $10 billion. Now, I am someone on this side of the aisle who voted against the bailout of Wall Street, the TARP, the $700 billion that we, we gave to, to Wall Street. I voted against that bailout because it allowed bonuses to be paid to executives who actually uh, caused some of the problems, and also because it demanded nothing of Wall Street. I will oppose this bailout, the one that's in this H.R. 2309, because it is unnecessary, unwarranted. I can't believe that we have people, some on both sides of the aisle, who call themselves fiscal, uh, fiscally responsible and are backing this measure to take $10 billion in taxpayer money and hand it to the Postal Service when the Postal Service has the resources themselves to correct this situation. I have a bill that I'll be offering as a substitute to this that actually uses United States Postal Service resources to bail themselves out instead of using taxpayer money. And it does so in a way that will move, the target is to move 100,000 people into retirement without using taxpayer money. It will be interesting to see how the members of this committee, who call themselves fiscal conservatives or fiscally responsible, how they respond to voting on this bill. This is, this is the moment. If you're going to talk the talk, this is when you've got to walk the walk. And we will let the people know who voted for the taxpayer bailout when it wasn't necessary. This bill also threatens the Postal Board of Governors and the Postal Management with the prospect of being forced into this uh, possibly illegitimate form of receivership. This bill that we're considering today will set up the collapse of, of the United States Postal Service as we know it. What's going to happen here is the conditions that the Postal Service will be required to operate under are completely impossible to satisfy. And when it comes to the point where the Postal Service cannot meet its singular obligation to prepay 
retiree health benefits, the provisions of this bill will dismantle the current operation of the, of the Postal Service and put in place a commission that will begin to dismantle the United States Postal Service as we know it today. It will lay off the most senior employees first, the people who are most experienced at running this system. It will keep the junior employees who know the least about how this system operates. It will create a BRAC-like system. BRAC is an acronym uh, that describes the base closing and realignment system that we use for our military bases. A BRAC-like system will be put in place to close post offices and facilities uh, all over this country, one that doesn't work very well, one that doesn't include a great amount of input from uh, members of Congress and, and from local communities. I'm also baffled by the fact that we're talking about postal reform less than four years after the last major postal overhaul. and. This bill, H.R. 2309, does nothing to tackle some of the main problems confronting the United States Postal Service. I would ask unanimous consent the gentleman have an additional 15 seconds oh, thank without you. objection. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Moreover, H.R. 2309 doesn't contain any language to rectify the ill-devised retiree health benefit payments that has caused the Postal Service to tap out of their $15 billion borrowing authority and accumulate record losses of $20 billion over the last four years. The fact of the matter is the Postal Management has done a, a fair job in trying to work through this fiscal uh, crisis that this country is in. And uh, I would encourage us to view today's proceeding as an opportunity to put in place some of the additional enhancements and operational flexibilities requested by the Postal Service that will allow it to operate for decades to come. Thank I, you. I, thank I, the I appreciate the extra time. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Of course. Uh, does any other member wish to speak on the bill? Uh, if the gentleman can suspend, I would go to the ranking member first. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, um, I would like to note the small improvements uh, made to H.R. 2309 by this amendment in the nature of a substitute, such as the removal of provisions that would have eliminated the application of Davis-Bacon prevailing wage requirements to contracts signed by the Postal Service. Given that the House has voted to uphold Davis-Bacon during consideration of H.R. 1, H.R. 658, H.R. 2017, H.R. 2055, and H.R. 2354, it is clear to the majority of our colleagues support it. That said, I continue to oppose the unilateral and sweeping changes that would be made to the Postal Service by the underlying bill as well as by this uh, uh, amendment. While the majority claimed in their briefing memo that the amendment in nature of the substitute would only make technical changes, the amendment actually contains some pretty substantive and, and detrimental additional uh, provisions. We have an historic opportunity to reform the Postal Service to meet the needs of a rapidly changing marketplace and to return this institution, which is as old as our republic, to profitability by implementing a revised and enhanced business model. The majority's legislation rejects that opportunity and instead proposes destructive policies that would take rights away from the Postal Service's workers, close facilities through a convoluted BRAC-like process in which members of Congress would have no voice and reduce service while doing little to meet the challenging needs of the American consumer. I cannot, uh, I cannot support a proposal that would override fairly negotiated collective bargaining agreements in order to lay off hundreds of thousands of hardworking Americans, particularly when there are more reasonable approaches available to right-size the Postal Service's workforce. Has the, majority, uh, even considered, has the majority even considered what impact their proposed reduction in forces process might have on veterans' preference, on disabled workers, or on older workers? I cannot support such an infringement 
on the rights of these or any other Americans. The amendment expands this attack on Postal Service employees by maintaining language that would treat postal workers different than other Federal workers when they are injured on the job. In addition, as we noted during the subcommittee's markup, amending the Federal Employees' Compensation Act falls to the expertise and the jurisdiction of the Education and Workforce Committee, which is currently pursuing changes to the Federal Workers' Compensation Program that would enhance the program for all covered employees. The Majority's amendment also opens the door to drastic cuts in delivery service by allowing a move from six-day to five-day delivery and by requiring curbside or cluster box only mail delivery for millions of citizens who currently receive their checks, packages, and medicines at their front door. That said, let me take a moment to discuss what the amendment in the nature of the substitute does not do. It does not go far enough to respect postal workers' years of committed service by providing them a dignified path to retirement. Notwithstanding the addition of language to permit a portion of the FERS surplus to be used for retirement incentives, the amendment would reach only a fraction of those eligible to retire and would continue to allow the control board to order mass layoffs. It does not rectify the burdensome and unrealistic retiree health benefits prepayment schedule, which is a fundamental cause of the Postal Service's current financial predicament. Instead, the amendment uses a missed prepayment as a tripwire for placing the Postal Service in receivership. Lastly, the amendment does not give the Postal Service the ability to innovate and fully explore new lines of business and services that could expand the Postal Service's bottom line. I intend to offer an amendment later this morning that would provide all of these needed reforms. As such, I urge rejection of the uh, Chairman's proposed amendment in the nature of a substitute. Instead of debating this ill-conceived legislation that cannot pass that of the Congress, we should embark on a bipartisan, bicameral effort to craft thoughtful legislation to ensure the Postal Service meets our Nation's changing needs. I hope others will join me, and, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. I thank the chairman. Would yield time to the uh, chairman of the committee. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I will be brief. Uh, I know the gentleman from Massachusetts is well intended in, in calling this a bailout. I, I know he wouldn't, wouldn't want to call it a bailout, but I might note that uh, your bill uh, was, in fact, spoken by the Postmaster General as one that would not get him through the next year, that, in fact, uh, the funding that uh, you envision does not get the Postmaster through the next year, and that our willingness to go with the GAO report and the figures that on a nonpartisan basis they came up with hopefully should at least let you know that we did look at the question of were there FERS monies. I might also note that uh, the Post Office does not have veterans at one level, it has veterans at all level, that no matter how we deal with 200,000, 220,000 more workers than are needed for a effect, efficient, effective delivery system of the mail, mail we will be affecting veterans. As being a veteran myself, I am well aware that no agency of the Federal Government employs more veterans than the Post Office. So whether it is 25 percent of the loss of jobs being people 65 and older eligible for retirement, or 45 or so, which is pretty close to where the youngest members tend to be in the post office, we will be laying off veterans. I do reject the gentleman's statement in, uh, in his opening statement that we somehow are getting rid of the old experienced workers in favor of young workers. There are no young workers to speak of at the post office. This has been an agency that has not been hiring in large amounts. They have shed many jobs, hundreds of thousands, through attrition. But that is because, in fact, they haven't been hiring. We have figures of the Federal workforce being 10 years, more than 10 years younger than the Post Office. This is a senior force. And anyone who uh, sees their postmen as they deliver, with the exception of temporary workers, will find that to be true. I do appreciate that we have to find funds and that Mr. Jordan, more than any other member of Congress, leads the uh, portion of the Congress that will not accept a bailout. It is twofold not a bailout for that reason. One, 
when one part of the government extends funds to reorganize another part of the government, it is not a bailout. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the government finding funds in a legitimate way to give the Post Office transition authority and transition time and transition funds. Secondly, the Post Office in this bill is pledging its assets, which it could otherwise seek a private sector loan on, except, of course, a private sector loan would have a higher cost than one based on Treasury bills. That is why we are finding the least expensive way to extend to the Post Office. Now, I might note that senior members of this committee on both sides of the aisle, when we established a $15 billion unsecured line of credit for the Post Office, saw nothing wrong with their ability to borrow $15 billion. Unfortunately, they borrowed that $15 billion at about a $5 billion a year run rate in order to pay for the prepayment that the gentleman objects to. I am perfectly willing to say here today that I would love nothing more than to eliminate the prepayment. However, if the Post Office were to shut down today, we would have a deficit that the taxpayers would have to pay of about $76 billion. We do not expect the Post Office to shut down today. But over the next many decades, those $76 billion will come due. And they will come due to a smaller workforce and a lower revenue unless something happens that is not currently foreseen in the, in the volume at the Post Office. So getting to a break-even, whether or not they can pay the so-called prepayment the next couple of years or not, isn't the point. The point is, over the next several decades, a leaner, more efficient post office will deliver services and will do so if we do our job right in a way in which they will not default during our careers on that obligation. If the post office's services become so small, I can predict today that we could still end up with a today a taxpayer bailout required 10, 20, 30 years from now. But we can only deal with what we are dealt with today, $65 billion in revenue and declining, a efficient system that lies beneath an inefficient system. By making the changes we need to do, the core of the Post Office will continue delivering high quality to every location in America services. Lastly, I do not to the 37 million homes that presently receive in their chute a mail or a bottle of pills, I do not intend on reducing services. Going to cluster boxes in our bill is intended to give advantages that do not occur. A cluster box is secure, lockable. It has an attached, normally larger compartment so that your boxes and, and other larger equipment can be left to you as in e-commerce more and more we have, we are receiving mail order. Lastly, the 109 million homes in America that got, walk out to their curb today are part of the solution. And I know that every American is willing to do a little something to ensure that the post office is there to serve all of us now and in the future. And with that, I thank the gentleman and yield back. The gentleman yields back. Anyone else request uh, the senior member, Mr. Kucinich, is first recognized? I thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Issa. Uh, I want to associate myself with the remarks of, uh, of uh, Mr. Cummings as well as the gentleman, uh, Mr. Lynch from Massachusetts, in expressing my concern about this uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute. One of the things that has concerned me throughout the entire debate over the Postal Service is that there doesn't appear to be enough um, commitment to the fundamental concept in the, uh, of universal service. And that universal service, which has been an important part of the commerce of this country, is threatened by this amendment in the nature of the substitute in the following ways. You start to reduce service to five days a week. There are going to, there's going to inevitably be an adverse effect on rural areas. If you, um, uh, instead of talking about downsizing the postal services, retail processing and administrative facilities, we should be looking at the present infrastructure they have and ask how we can use it even more effectively as a commercial uh, vehicle. We are going in the opposite direction. It is almost like a company 
that determines that it just wants to start to go out of business. You know, when I look at what's happened in, our, in the neighborhoods in the Cleveland area, you know, first you uh, started to see the neighborhood post boxes disappearing. And, and that was a staple for many neighborhoods. People would be able to, instead of having to drive to a post office, just walk to a post box and put the, the mail in. And then you started to see branches disappearing, which impose, have a, imposed a real hardship. And then you start to see private competitive mail facilities being put right on the same property of the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, to me, uh, you know, notwithstanding the, the important role that this committee has on matters relating to the Postal Service, it seems as though there has been a concerted effort inside the Postal um, uh, Service at the top just to move towards a privatization model, to just take the steps to put us out of business. But in addition to that, there is something else going on that I find deeply disturbing, and that is to make the the employees of the Postal Service, second-class citizens. The big battle that is happening all across the country now, including in my state of Ohio, is what kind of rights do workers have if they happen to work for the public? And, you know, the battle in Ohio is over issue um, uh, Senate Bill 5, uh, State uh, uh, Issue 2, which I am in Ohio urging the defeat of. But I look at, at the uh, Amendment in the nature of the substitute. And postal service employees would see their workers' compensation uh, benefits reduced um, as compared to what other Federal workers would receive under the Federal Employees Compensation Act. You know, the, the, particularly if you are talking about. Uh, uh, letter carriers, but there are other people in the Postal Service who are dealing with uh, automated systems. You know, people get hurt on the job. And why should they have to look at a situation where their benefits would be adversely affected? Uh, we also know from our staff memo that Postal Service employees who are totally disabled receive, would receive only 50 percent of their monthly compensation rather than 66 and two thirds uh, when they meet age and service requirements for retirement. Why are we doing this to, to the people who serve the public? Why? What is the reason or rationale that we are making those who work for the post office second-class citizens among all those who work for the Federal Government? It is not fair and it is not right. Uh, in a way, not only are we moving towards a privatized model, but we are starting to treat the employees as though we already have privatized. And so I, I think that it's, it is important for us to broaden this discussion here about what model our post office is moving towards. And I, I hope that, uh, uh, that, that my friends on, on this uh, committee will, uh, will not give up on a dream of universal service, uh, will not give up on the fact that this uh, postal service belongs to the people of the United States, and we should not ever think of letting that ownership pass into the hands of the private sector. I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Anyone else seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the uh, recognition. Uh, let's, let's look at the facts. First of all, the facts are the post office is broke. At the end of its fiscal year of September 30th, they were $10 billion in debt. They will be lucky if they can make payroll next summer. Eighty percent of their cost is labor. Their unions have done a fantastic job of negotiating contracts to include a no layoff clause. Their first class mail, their revenues have declined 20 percent in five years. I don't know about you, but I was not elected to make easy decisions and postpone problems. We have a problem here in the United States Postal Service that is bipartisan, bicameral, and it can no longer be kicked down the road. We are going to have to make some hard decisions. I recognize my good friend from across the aisle, Mr. Lynch, who had a great idea that we have incorporated into the nature of a substitute that allows for us to take the overpayment in the FERS, the FERS account, to help incentivize 150,000 employees of the Postal Service who are more than eligible for retirement so that we can reduce those roles which we need to reduce by 200,000 by the year 2015. 
This is not a bill of layoffs. This is not a bill of punishment. This is not a bill of second-class citizens. More importantly, this is a bill to make sure that we make the decisions necessary to make sure that this institution that has been in existence longer than this country survives, and survives for another 200 years. I laud my effort, the efforts of my chairman. I look forward to this amendatory process, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we now recognize the former chairman of the full committee, Mr. Towns, for five minutes. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. And let me say that, um, and I listened to the comments coming from uh, um, um, my colleague um, in reference to hard decisions. I mean, yeah, well, I don't have a problem with hard decisions, but let's make good decisions. You know, uh, everybody is talking about job creation, and we're talking about job elimination. And I don't think that's the kind of decision that we need to make. I think that we need to look at what we're dealing with here and try and create some flexibility. I think if we can provide flexibility, a lot of the things we're talking about you know, uh, will sort of disappear. We need to have a little more discussion and more dialogue before we move forward. Uh, and I think that uh, to do it without having more discussion and more dialogue is the wrong way to go. When I go home to my district, you know, people are talking about jobs, they're talking about employment. And when you look at the Postal Service, I mean, these are jobs that move people into the middle class. And I want you to know that that bothers me. So we should stress flexibility, give them some opportunity to do some other things that will make it possible for them to exist at the same level that they exist. And of course, uh, uh, and I think that we need to look at that. I know we all complain about the census and about the fact that the census, the count is inadequate and not accurate. Well, who knows more about the census than the postal people? So maybe they need to be involved in the discussion around that. I just think that to move in this fashion with this substitute amendment is not the thing to do. I think we need to have the stakeholders more involved in this discussion along with us. You know, and, and I'm not for appointing a committee or a super committee here, but I think that a further discussion is needed before we move forward. And I'm very uncomfortable moving at this level with this information that we have and knowing the situation that we have back in our districts uh, where we're talking about laying off 200,000 people. I mean, that to me uh, is very frightening, and I think that we need to look at the other things that happen when we do this. You know, uh, when we look at the fact that when people have no jobs, the kind of antisocial behavior that develops when that occurs, we need to look at that, how every state in the union is building prisons. Let's look at the whole issue before we move forward. And if we're not going to do that, then I'm not sure we're doing what we're supposed to do as members of the United States Congress. On that note, would, would the gentleman yield? I'd be delighted to yield to the chairman. You know, to my friend and colleague that we worked so closely together on, Today we are going to be looking at alternatives to the current uh, bill in which we seek to expedite the retirement of roughly 255,000 workers who are fully eligible for retirement over the next few years. That may not survive the final passage. We may go with the alternate. But I would tell my friend that that is the challenge we have for the Post Office to work on together whether it is to have people enjoy their golden years sooner or to have people in their 30s and 40s uh, without a job. And, and I look forward to working with the gentleman on trying to find the best language for that, uh, because I know your concern is legitimate and real, and I don't want to put people on the streets, but I do want to put postage in the box at an affordable price. And I want to work with you, but I will not be able to support reform that is placed the uh, the problem on the backs of the working people. I will not do it. I mean, uh, that, that place strictly on the backs of the hardworking employees of the Postal Service. I can't do it. I would be delighted to yield. Will the gentleman yield? I want to thank the gentleman for his uh, statement. And um, I admire you for your compassion. And that is something, uh, and the chairman will tell you, that almost every discussion that we have had with regard to this legislation uh, the word compassion uh, has one, one that I have raised. Um, and the things that you said are so true. We, we need to be trying to create jobs instead of getting rid of jobs. But at the same time, 
we all realize that we have got to do this balancing act, um, and we have got to find that balance. And so, you know, I really do appreciate what the Chairman has said to you and, and what he said to me, that uh, even beyond this markup, hopefully we will be able to, there is not going to be, not, not going to be much agreement, I think, in this markup, but hopefully we will be able to go beyond this and uh, before it comes to the floor and try to address it. And I think the Chairman will have a statement about that later on. But uh, I just want to thank you for your compassion. And I yield back to the gentleman. Thank you. The gentleman, give me an additional 30 seconds. Without objection. I yield. Yeah, I yield to um, gentleman. Mr. Lynch from Massachusetts. Massachusetts, yeah. Thank you. I just want to point out uh, under the current bill that the monies that would be available uh, from the FERS overpayment. Uh, that under my bill would allow us to retire uh, in the area of 100,000 employees out of the post office, move them into retirement. Uh, that, that would be taken away in this bill, most of it, uh, to, to satisfy uh, CSRS payments or for, for, uh, for retiree health benefits. So uh, the bill that is being considered right now, the, the amendment in the nature of a substitute would, would wipe out the opportunity to move people into retirement. Uh, and I just want to remind people that these postal workers out there, and, and uh, you know, I have got postal workers in my family, my mom, my sisters, uh, you know, so uh, I hear, I, hear I, know, I know way too much about this. Uh, they have seen their retirement, their thrift savings plans cut by 40 percent. They have seen their home values cut. And so, right, w when you say they are eligible for retirement, under no normal circumstances, if we had a good economy, if their home values had been maintained, if their retirement, their thrift savings plan hadn't lost so much value, yeah, they would be, they would be ready to retire. They are not. So what we are trying to do in, in my bill is to provide a little incentive, move them out the door. Uh, into a dignified retirement with, with a little incentive and, and reduce the number of people at the post office and reduce the number of post offices and facilities that we have out there. But uh, to do it in a humane way that respects the dignity of the work they have provided to this country. And uh, one, one last point, you know, people keep talking about the labor intensive, uh, or the labor intensive costs to the Postal Service. The reason that it costs the Postal Service more in labor in terms of their operation is because they deliver to places like Eggnog, Utah, and, uh, you know, Toad Suck, Arkansas, and, uh, you know, Skinny Dip, Tennessee, where, where these private companies do not deliver. We deliver six days a week to every home and business in America. And, yeah, it, it's probably a, a an inefficient, cost, ineffective way to do that, but we promise universal service. So the post office does it, but, and, and I'm, not, I'm not slamming UPS. They're, they're a fine, fine company. The former chairman's time has long expired. Yeah, I, 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 I know I'm, 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 I'm pushing my limit, but you, you get my point. You get well, comparing well, apples and I, I, th I thank the gentleman and I thank the former chairman well, the who, who, who invented back. the word long expired for this committee. Uh, I, I would ask that we have the ability to correct the record for the correct pronunciation of Tosuck, Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> and with that, I recognize the gentlelady Mr. from New Chair, York. Mr. Chair, on behalf of, uh, I guess I recognize the gentleman from Utah. Uh, of those of us from Eggnog, Utah, I want to thank you for this special recognition. And, and the people in Elmo, Utah, will also thank you. So I appreciate it. We recognize the gentlelady from uh, New York for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Chairman Ross, uh, for your hard work, and particularly Chairman Ross for uh, uh, working with uh, my constituents on an important amendment that will save jobs. I, I, I very much want to be uh, associated with the statements of Ranking Member Cummings and Lynch and Kucinich and uh, my good friend from New York, Mr. Towns, uh, that, that they, these are sweeping and, and drastic changes. and, and uh, they create serious uh, policy concerns. Uh, we all know that uh, the Post Office faces a long-term structural operating deficit uh, due to the drop in volume because of the economy and, and, and shift towards electronic communication. But there is uh, questions about how to fix it. I, I uh, very much want to continue our support for universal service. 
And in certain areas, the, the urban areas, uh, uh, post offices uh, make a great deal of money, which subsidizes the rural areas of our country that have very few people coming to the post office but need these services. So any, any reduction in, in support for it, in effect, will, will affect uh, the, the, the universal service. The, the so-called control board uh, is, is very troubling to me uh, because this commission would be empowered to reject and even terminate uh, collective bargaining agreements. And, uh, and it also would exclude any input from members of Congress. In, in my, the district that I represent, for example, uh, they have put on a closing list a post office that is literally on an island. Now, I do think a lot of my constituents walk on water, uh, but it's very hard for them to get to any post office if this particular post office is closed. And it is one that is making over 560000 a year, but their cutoff number was 600000 a year. So this, this whole community that really is a island uh, would be without any postal service. So not allowing or, or having uh, the input of those of us who represent areas and know their concerns is very troubling. I, I, I would like to ask uh, my good friend, Mr. Ross, to give me this new GAO report, uh, because the numbers that I, I, I've been looking at is this, this mandate that required the Postal Service to pre-fund it, its future retiree health benefits at a cost of more than $5.5 billion annually, and no other agency was uh, required to do that. And apparently you said this is no longer in this GAO report, that funding is... Uh, if the gentleman would yield up. If, if I yield to the gentleman. And Thank also the, the, uh, the statement about the overpayment of both the civil service retirement system and the federal employee retirement system. The papers I read last night said that the obligations range between 60 to 80 billion. And, um, uh, and that would, have, of course, help us alleviate this problem. But you say you have another report that uh, addresses this. Uh, and I yield to you for clar clarification. Yes, ma'am, uh, on both points. Mm -hmm. First of all, the, the, uh, there was a bipartisan, bicameral request uh, to the GAO with regard specifically to the, uh, uh, whether there exists any overpayment into the CSRS made by the Postal Service. Uh, that report will be released today. A draft was released last night that indicated that not only was there no overpayment, that the calculations were correct and that there were no errors, that to, to recognize any such overpayment would cost the U.S. Treasury anywhere between $55 and $85 billion. With regard to the second point, in the prefunding, the 2006 Postal Info uh, Enhancement and Accountability Act required at that time for the Postal Service to prefund its future uh, retirement and health care benefits. That has been at the rate of about $5.5 billion a year. I think there is an amendment here today to address that. But even assuming that if that were taken away, uh, the Postal Service would still show a $4.5 billion profit for this year. So uh, there, there are two separate uh, issues. One has to do with prefunding health care and, and pension benefits, and the other has to do with whether there ever existed an overpayment uh, since the 1971 when the uh, Postal Department became the Postal Service. Well, I, I thank the gentleman. My time has almost expired. I, I want to voice my support for the, uh, the, the provision to allow our, our men and women to retire with dignity the, that uh, Mr. Lynch spoke uh, about. And I'm hopeful that during this markup we will come to an agreement on some of the thoughtful amendments that uh, will be offered that reflect uh, compromises in some of these areas. And I want to express my support for the dedicated, hardworking postal employees in our country. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady, and I look forward to getting to those amendments as soon as possible. And with, and with that, I, I think the last opening statement, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, it's been 222 years since the founders enshrined the Postal Service in Article I of the Constitution. I don't believe there's any other service mandated by the founders in the Constitution other than the Postal Service. That's how important they thought it was. And I hear a lot of people talk about how they believe in the Constitution. I remember, in fact, when we began the 112th Congress, we actually, and I participated in it, we read every section, pretty much, of the Constitution because of our devotion to that document. So hopefully that devotion will imbue the spirit of this markup. I listened intently to the opening statement of the chairman of this committee, and uh, his words were heartening.
to hear the desire expressed for a bipartisan bill. But let us be honest, that is not what we have in front of us now. In fact, at the markup, at the subcommittee level, there was an aggressive attempt to make sure the bill was not bipartisan. Every single Democratic amendment was defeated. Even an amendment after we heard a friend on the other side of the aisle profess publicly his commitment to preserving six-day-a-week mail delivery, he promptly voted against, nonetheless, an amendment that would have guaranteed just that. I know it was my amendment. So if we mean to have a bipartisan bill, then we have got to work across the aisle. And I know attempts were made, sincere attempts by both sides, as late as last night to do that. But let us not pretend there isn't a chasm between us that it will be very difficult to bridge. It is interesting to learn there is some 11th hour study that negates testimony we have had before this committee in the last Congress and this that indeed there is an overpayment that is owed the Postal Service, that burdens the Postal Service, that indeed Congress has required a prepayment required of no other Federal entity that overly burdens the Postal Service and exacerbates the red ink number, which, if corrected by this Congress since we, corrected the, uh, since we cr uh, created the problem, would significantly ease some of the pressure and buy us some time to think about the, the uh, business model of the future. What we are being presented with in this bill today is a false choice. The Postal Service is sick and ailing. That is true. Therefore, you must accept there is only one answer. Go from six to five. But we don't necessarily agree. You have to abolish collective bargaining and eviscerate the rights, the hard-earned rights of working men and women in the Postal Service, including many, many veterans, well, we don't agree. You are going to have to radically alter how rural ma mail is delivered in America. And you are going to have to change the mode of home delivery of mail in America. Well, we don't necessarily agree. We think there are alternatives that could be pursued. Several of us have introduced legislation to that effect. We even have a gratuitous provision that was added to this bill basically to punish one whole state, Alaska. That is not the spirit of bipartisan compromise. That is not the spirit of trying to find honest common ground for solutions to problems that have to be acknowledged and that are real. I believe that there can be common ground, but I don't believe this bill does it. And I don't believe there was much of an attempt, in at least when we marked it up at the subcommittee level, to even go through the pretense of bipartisan cooperation. And so if we are going to have it, the concerns, the legitimate concerns acknowledged on this side of the aisle have to be acknowledged, it seems to me, on that side of the aisle if we are going to achieve the noble goal set out by the chairman of this committee in his uh, heartening opening statement. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Platts, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, certainly appreciate the work that you and your staff and the ranking member and, and uh, his staff have, have put into this bill. And, and I think we all have agreement the need for reform, the need for more fiscally sound operation. Um, and I, I look forward to uh, the process as we go forward here today on the various amendments. I, I just wanted to express um, a couple of concerns, and, and they may be, will be addressed uh, by amendments that are coming forward. Um, one is the, the issue of fairness that has been raised regarding existing employees um, and, and the issue of retirement eligible um, being who the focus under the, the underlying uh, um, substitute. Um, and, and maybe this is an issue that um, I am more sensitive to, as uh, probably many families today have suffered, where a family member, older uh, worker, has been let go and um, 55, 60 years of age prior to being ready to retire uh, and, and finding it very difficult to get a, a new job because of their age. Uh, I know personally from a family member forced uh, to retire about age 55. Uh, the um, company in question waited six months to the age discrimination. Uh, the statute ran and then hired the person back in the same job, just no benefits and save money. And, and under the underlying substitute, that we would force the oldest 
to retire, and, and I believe that would mean 55 years uh, to be um, retirement eligible is 55 years of age with a certain number of years of service. Uh, 55 and 30 years of right. service or 60 with 25 years. Right. So um, on a Teletown Hall meeting I had this past week where I had someone slightly younger that had the years of service but not yet at 55, but maybe would be by the time this became uh, effective. That doesn't mean that you know if they're forced to retire in this economy at age 55, uh, with a fraction of their income now coming in, um, and maybe kids going to college, I mean they're going to be struggling to find a new job in this economy, uh, and yet getting a fraction of their income. So that's that's a concern. And add to that is the fact that the way the underlying bill is written, it says that you know somebody who maybe went and served four years in the military, came out at age 22, came back, joined the postal service is now 55, that we are going to say that we are going to treat you less favorably after 33 years of service to the service, uh, postal service than somebody who maybe has been there six months. In other words, they have dedicated their adult life to serving as a postal carrier or in whatever role, and we are going to treat them less favorable. So that is a, a concern. Um, uh, would the gentleman yield for be glad comment? To. Uh, one of the other members of the committee has in draft now, and I have been informed, an amendment that would harmonize to the existing Federal reduction in force system, the procedure, uh, and the Chair is prepared to uh, vote in favor of that. So it is an area of concern that, uh, uh, for the sake of being consistent with the rest of the government, we are willing to accept. So it may it, I, I, yeah, and I am looking forward to the seeing that amendment and, and the um, specifics of that amendment. Uh, a final comment is just on the uh, on the door delivery. I, I represent a district that's more older um, uh, neighborhoods, either um, city or older suburbs. Uh, heavy, heavy percentage is uh, door delivery. Um, understand um, the the move within two years that no more than 25 percent is door uh, delivery, uh, mail slot delivery, and after four years, no more than 10 percent. Uh, in my district, that would have a huge impact on many historic neighborhoods. Uh, in my district. Um, the fact that they have that service is something that is a value in their home values. In other words, that neighborhood, because of the quaintness, you don't have mailboxes down the street, uh, the convenience, everything. So just something, again, to consider from a fairness standpoint as we look at all aspects of this. And again, yeah, I think the, the Chairman. gentleman would yield. Uh, Mr. Turner of Ohio brought much of the same concern, and we, we addressed what we could address by putting a requirement in the base text. Uh, that they have to mitigate and, and these, these cluster or curb bo uh, boxes have to be consistent with the community, the architecture, and so on. I might also note, though, that we only eliminate, if you will, we only try to achieve 90 percent of those. So we fully recognize that out of 37 million homes, probably 3.7 million, we can anticipate many more years before a solution would be worked out if, for them. If we could arrange for Mr. Turner to have his area go first and mine to go very last, uh, that would be favorable. So, um, well, you know, I think Williamsburg, Virginia could, in fact, uh, be even, even older than York. <laughs> uh, again, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you and the ranking member and uh, look forward to the amendments that will be, uh, be brought forward. So uh, yield back the balance. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, in order of seniority, we now go to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I think all of us agree that these are indeed serious and difficult times and that they require serious and difficult thought as well as action. It is also clear to me that some changes must be made. There is no doubt about that. However, in some instances, I think that we are preparing to do what I call throw out the baby with the bathwater. It is good to get rid of antiquated approaches, but I have a great deal of concern about worker protection and worker rights. And I will have an amendment to deal with with one of the proposals. But I am also concerned, Mr. Chairman, about the approach that we are moving towards and thinking. It just occurred to me that there is a whole section of my congressional district and the community that I live in and work in that is right now 
on a list to close five facilities that stretches all the way from downtown Chicago through all of the rest of the city out to the next town. And of course, the idea is that these facilities are not generating the same kind of revenue that might be generated in some other places. And I think as we restructure the Postal Service, that we have to think in terms of a service in addition to the business approaches that we use. It is obvious that some communities will not generate the same kind of revenue that other communities will generate. But that does not deny the need that those individuals have for services. And I think there has to be a philosophical approach that continues to look at the whole question of universal service, of equal rights, and of equal opportunity. And so I will yield back and, and, and attempt to deal with the protection of workers as we get into the amendment section. I thank you very much and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. And we now recognize the gentleman from Vermont for his patience. Five minutes. Uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to make three points. First, whatever we do has to result in the Postal Service being around for another 200 years. It served us well, doing important work for Americans for over 200 years. What we do in this Congress has to make certain that it continues for generations to come. Second, uh, the concerns expressed by many here about the cost of the Postal Service are legitimate concerns. They happen to be shared by the Postal Service, by the men and women who are delivering mail, as well as those who manage it. And they have made very significant reductions. So any suggestion in the course of this debate that the people on the front lines whose jobs are at stake, who have been working hard, don't share and haven't actually made steps that are painful to acknowledge this cost uh, is out of bounds, because they have been dealing with this with very hard decisions day in and day out that have affected working conditions and services. And then third, there has to be an acknowledgment by this committee that it is unfair to apply a private sector business model to the function of the Postal Service. If you are FedEx or UPS, you can pick and choose your routes. You can do that on the basis of where you are going to make the most money. You cannot deliver in rural areas if that doesn't suit your business uh, or your shareholder bottom line. The Postal Service is incredibly important to so many of us in rural America, and it has to deliver where the people are. That is expensive. And that does mean there is a decision about whether there has to be some help from the taxpayer to make certain that the taxpayers get their mail delivered where they live and get it delivered on time. Thank you, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Does any, uh, we now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma uh, to offer his amendment. Yes, I believe I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309, offered by Mr. Langford of Oklahoma. The gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I understand full well we are not just talking about a USPS uh, issue here. We are talking about families that are involved. We are talking about civil servants. Uh, that have served for a long time. I want to provide the maximum amount of flexibility that Mr. Uh, former Chairman Towns uh, referenced before that we need to allow some flexibility into the system. One of the core issues, obviously, that we are dealing with is in the deficit and the climbing debt from USPS is the prepayment of retiree health care benefits. Um, that was agreed upon and passed in 2006. But after 2006, obviously, USPS uh, experienced dramatic uh, reduction and, and downturn in their mail volume, and it has led to a, a climbing debt. And now to this reform at USPS. Uh, I would like to recommend, and uh, it comes up through this amendment, the nature, uh, this amendment into the amendment in the nature of substitute, is that we give USPS this year, uh, we change their prepayment to $1 billion rather than the $5.5 billion. 
and that gives them an opportunity to be able to catch their financial breath to allow some of these reforms to be able to kick in, and that we would move that prepayment uh, that they would typically do for this year, which would be coming due now, November the 18th, uh, that we would move that to the end, split it in half, move it to the end of uh, the 2015 and also 2016, again, to provide them that kind of flexibility. So that is the nature of my amendment. Uh, would the gentleman yield? Yes, I would. The Chair is uh, disposed to support this amendment. We have it from the Congressional Budget Office that, that the amount of your amendment is the amount that they have scored as possible to be paid under the circumstances. Certainly in a business world, when you have a, uh, a bank that you owe money to and you are supposed to pay them 5.5 and they see that all you can pay is one, uh, this kind of loan modification would be a effective uh, a use of the best interest. So in, uh, because of the CBO scoring and because of the reality of the current financial situation of the Post Office, uh, I am prepared to uh, uh, accept it. Is there anyone else who would wish to speak on this amendment? Mr. Lynch is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I appreciate the gentleman from Oklahoma's uh, amendment. I, I understand the spirit in which it is offered. Uh, <clears throat> however, it, it would be far better, I think. Now, Again, the Postal Service is the only entity in America today that is required to meet its retiree health benefits in this fashion. If you read the bill that was adopted, PAEA, back in 2006, it, uh, it actually has, a, has a, a menu of payments. It says on this date you pay five, bill, five point something billion, on this date you pay five, without any regard for when the obligations arise. So. If we were trying, I, I think the goal here is to try to create a sustainable post office going forward. That's the goal, and I think it would be far better if we required the post office put language in that said uh, the post office shall meet its obligations, its health benefit obligations to its retirees under prudent and accepted business practices as they arise. That is how every other business in America has to operate. As, as people age, as they come into the workforce, as they leave, they are required to, to address the obligations that, that historically come forward. And that is how we, that's the, that's the obligation that we put on every business, except for the post office. They have got to actually fund health care benefits in this case, in some cases, before a person, for that person before they come to work at the post office, which is, which is absolutely absurd. So while I, I appreciate the relief that the gentleman is providing in his amendment, and it is, it is significant and it is appreciated, and I, and I don't mean to denounce or, 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 or criticize, but I, I think if we are really, th this will get them a year. It will give them a year to catch their breath, as you, as you so aptly described. Uh, but if we are really thinking about building a sustainable entity here, then I think if we are going to change it, we are going to have a fight. We are going to have a fight with the Senate, because this was their language that put in this payment schedule. If we are going to fight, let's fight a good fight to, to put this system in balance in a sustainable way going forward for, for many years. Let's not just fight for a year of change. Let's, let's fight for putting the post office on an even keel, something that can be sustained, uh, as the gentleman says, over the next uh, several decades. I, I yield back. But I do appreciate would, would, would the gentleman. Would the gentleman yield for just a second? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, not because I can make facts occur that I don't have, but because we anticipate that toward the end of the year, CBO will score again. There may, there may be a modification, a greater number. Uh, we, uh, I think, are supporting this one because it is a number we have with us today. I join with the gentleman in recognizing that we have to work with the Senate to provide all funds necessary to transition the Post Office from where it is today to where it needs to be as a, a world-class organization. And, uh, I share the gentleman's uh, feeling that this may not be enough to get us all the way to the goalpost. It is just what we could find that was scorable under current uh, interpretation of the CBO. So I do share the gentleman's concern that we need to find more if possible. I appreciate the gentleman's point. The gentleman, you. 
I will. I would like to yield to the ranking member, Mr. Cummings. It's just one quick thing. You know, I'm glad that the uh, gentleman from Oklahoma addresses this, uh, this uh, retiree health benefits plan. But, you know, the Postal Service already has a $42 billion set aside in their fund and needs full relief uh, this year and maybe next year before they continue to be forced uh, to prepay. And so um, I just I know that the gentleman has uh, uh, honorable intentions, but that's, I think that is something that we need to keep in consideration, too. I yield back to the gentleman. I think the gentleman, if there is no further I would like to yield 30 right. seconds to the gentleman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I simply want to associate uh, myself with the remarks of Mr. Lynch and uh, commend the maker of this amendment. Would the gentleman uh, repeat with his microphone on or a little I would like closer? To associate myself with the remarks of the ranking member of the Postal Subcommittee. I thank the gentleman. If there is no further discussion, the question is on the amendment of the Nate. To, uh, sorry, one back. The, the question is on the amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Uh, are there any additional amendments? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Cummings. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Without objection, so ordered, the gentleman is, is or after she designates. Go ahead. Substitute for the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Mr. Cummings of Maryland. The gentleman is uh, unanimous consent is accepted. The gentleman is uh, uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As I mentioned in my uh, opening statement, I do not believe the legislation we are considering today is the right solution for the Postal Service. The Postal Service is facing serious financial challenges. In its current form, however, this bill does not offer a viable solution. For that reason, I am offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute similar to legislation I introduced with Congressman Lynch, the Innovate to Deliver Act of 2011. The 12-D Act will address head-on the specific problems the Postal Service is facing and will enable it to meet these challenges by implementing reforms in three core areas, profitability, personnel, and performance. Unlike the proposal before us today offered by the majority, which would merely slash services, destroy the rights of the Postal Service's unionized employees, and establish a laborious process for closing facilities that essentially eliminates our ability as members of Congress to represent the concerns of our communities, the amendment I am offering tackles fundamental challenges with fundamental changes that will reverse the Postal Service's fiscal curve. Our amendment authorizes the Postal Service to enter into new lines of business that leverage its unique advantages, such as check cashing, facility leasing, and retail services. This will give the Postal Service the flexibility to function more like a business and expand its partnerships with pr the private sector. The amendment also creates a chief innovation officer to drive the development of these new innovative products and services, as well as new core mailing services. When, importantly, this legislation requires the Postal Regulatory Commission to immediately revisit the, uh, the pay schedule for the Retiree Health Benefits Fund prepayments established in the 2006 Postal Reform Law. The legislation will also streamline postal regulations and procedures to help keep the Postal Service's excellent service record intact. One thing the Innovate to Deliver Act will not do is deny workers the rights they are guaranteed in contracts negotiated in good faith with the postal management. This step, which is proposed in the legislation offered by the majority, is counterproductive and unnecessary. Instead, our bill will refund the estimated $6.9 billion the Postal Service has overpaid into the Federal Employees Retirement System enable, and enable the Postal Service to use those funds to provide incentives for voluntary separation and early retirement to the estimated 200,000 employees who will become eligible to retire by 2015. In other words, compassionate retiring. After meeting with the Postal Service, Postal Workers Unions and the Administration while drafting this bill, I am proud to say that these key stakeholders support many of the provisions in the amendment 
Congressman Lynch and I are offering. Uh, I do not believe the legislation authored by the majority shares the same level of support. In fact, although the Chairman's legislation has little support, he seems determined to move it through this committee with little to no input from other members. This type of one-sided action will not save the Postal Service and does nothing to foster the kind of bipartisanship, bicameral effort needed to craft legislation that can actually pass the Congress. I previously, previously stated that there are many provisions in the Chairman's legislation that I do support and that I am willing to move forward on a bipartisan solution that could garner broad support in both the House and the Senate. So far, we have not been able to achieve that, but I am hoping that we will be able to. The amendment in the nature of, the, of a substitute I am offering embodies many of the reforms needed to put the Postal Service back on track towards financial solvency. The Postal Service touches all of our districts and is valued by all Americans. I hope this committee can work together to develop a solution that reflects the values of the American people. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I would uh, recognize myself. As, as the gentleman knows, there are many aspects to uh, your earlier bill that we have looked at and we are incorporating, particularly recognizing with the GAO's figure uh, the ability to give the net amount that they believe is, at least in the current uh, year, uh, excess back to the post office to use as operating funds. As you can imagine, we are more concerned about giving the gross amount back, but saw the point of finding a number that can be agreed to by a nonpartisan organization and striking it. And so I appreciate the gentleman recognizing that early on as a potential source of, of revenue. Um, I do reluctantly not support the, the amendment for two reasons. First of all, I believe that it lacks some of the substance required uh, to reduce overall costs. And I recognize that some of that is a service question. It is a service question whether you remain permanently at six day or you go to some new hybrid. It is a service question whether you uh, uh, move postal delivery a few feet from the home into a secure box. It is a service question about whether or not uh, you, uh, uh, you close post offices or consolidate uh, processing centers. And I recognize that we may not agree on it, but frankly, our bill attempts to say that it is not for us to agree on it, it is for the postal professionals to, uh, to work on it. Lastly, and perhaps the one that most causes me not to be able to support the amendment, it creates a large increase in postal rate, something that we believe and the Postmaster believes and the Board of Governors believe would drive down volume quickly and only exacerbate the, uh, the challenge we are facing. Uh, later today, there will be amendments offered, including one by myself, that will stay some of the increases in the base bill in order to get the efficiencies first and then the necessary revenue increases later. This way, we, while we are improving efficiency, our hope is not to lose charity mail and periodical mail that today represent a tremendous amount of volume. So I will continue to work with the ranking member because I believe that members of your side of the aisle have already, by the close of business today, dramatically improved the bill, and that if we continue to work uh, now and as we go to the Senate, that we will get this bill right. We will get it, as the gentleman so kindly said, with the compassion for those who have given so many years of service and a recognition that the American people want us to be fair, but they want us to be responsible. So although I am not uh, going to be voting in favor of your amendment, I do appreciate the work you have done to help us do better. And with that, I yield yeah, back. Mr. 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 Chairman, well, I would yield just, to the for, just for a moment. Of course. I just want to thank you very much for what you just said. Um, we heard from the same folks that you did, and uh, we are delaying any increase till 2015 to prevent rate shock. We are talking about rates. And so we, we, uh, we understood that. Um, during our discussions earlier, one, one of the things that we said, not, not in this room, but in our side discussions, was the concern that when you raise rates, you also may cause uh, volume to go down. And, and I understand that. And so the, we tried to address that by delaying that until 2015. I yield back to the gentleman. I'm reclaiming my time. I thank the gentleman.
And with that, if there is no further, oh, uh, I would uh, yield back and recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania for five minutes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My, my comments are going to be short, Mr. Chairman, but, but I share with many on this committee the genuine interest in trying to resolve this problem and have spent weeks working on it, have sat and met with numerous of, of the individuals that live in my district trying to find ways in which we can look at this issue. And I guess I am new to Washington, and I know this happens on both sides, but it is very frustrating to me to look at something in which, and, and I have tremendous respect for you, uh, Mr. Cummings, and, and uh, the work that has been put in here. But it, it, I think there is a lot of ideas, but to come in and then give this five minutes before we are getting ready to go in. How do I have the opportunity to legitimately take into consideration many of the issues that you have before I got to cast a vote? I think there are some things that could have been worked on. This is the only bill I had to work with. I sat down there for hours at night trying to find ways to make this work, not a peep for other things in which we could find ways to do it. And now I know the politics of it will look good, but now I'm going to go back and have to talk to my workers about how I didn't do all of these. You know, these could be reasonable solutions. So I'm just, I just need to tell you how frustrated I am to see such a meaningful piece of work minutes before we're asked to cast votes. The gentleman yield. Yes. Since the gentleman uh, addressed his concerns to me, let me be clear that we get the same amount of time that you have on amendments. And these are, this is Washington, and this is, this is a very difficult uh, task that we are about here. And my bill, with the bill that is actually the substitute, the amendment, my amendment, was filed over a month ago. Um, so what I am saying is that this is part of our process. One of the things that the Chairman has said, by the way, is that as we go through this process that we will have disagreements. Um, but the Chairman has said, and he can correct me if I am wrong, that he wants to make sure that even after today that we sit down and if there are still differences, try to work out what we can. Um, I have committed to the Chairman and he has committed to me that we want to try to make this a bipartisan effort. I think that is extremely important, extremely. I think the American people want that. And I said, I don't know if you were here in my open, during my opening statement, I said, if we can't get this done, we don't need to be here. If we can't get this done, this is basic. This is, what, Chevrolet and apple pie? You know, this is it. And so, and affecting all of us. And it's so important. And I think, and, and, and another thing, I think you will hear a lot of compassion on both sides. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, 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 I try to make sure I put myself in other people's shoes and understand where they're coming from. But, I mean, you heard Mr. Lynch as he talked about his family members and how he feels about it. I mean, just, I mean, just gut-wrenching issues. And so I think if we can, can take all of that passion and compassion and develop a bipartisan bill, we will be in great, great shape. Last but not least, my mother, who was a former sharecropper who only had a second grade education, used to say, don't have motion, commotion, emotion, and no results. And so we are determined to have results that make sense. And so I want to thank the gentleman for what you said, but I wanted to make it clear that, you know, we, we're trying to, this is a tough, tough process. Would the gentleman yield further? Uh, you know, this is the first major markup that this committee has done on an issue of this sort. And uh, that makes it the first major markup that I've done as chairman. Uh, I would say to you that we will get better as I have more time on this. Uh, but I will also, I also say that if not for the work that you have been doing the last 48 hours in pushing for things that from your years in Federal service you knew could be done that could make this bill better, we wouldn't be prepared to make the bill as good as it is going to be when it leaves here today. Uh, in my nearly 11 years here, the one thing I have learned from people like uh, Billy Tozen and John Dingell and others who came before me is, although John Dingell will be here after I am gone, I am sure, uh, the, uh, that a bill has to be living through the entire process. 
and I have made a commitment to the ranking member, and I make that same commitment to you. If additional ideas come to you and additional solutions come to you, as some of them that you are going to be offering here today, uh, I will ensure that we find a way to get it into the manager's amendment, if at all possible, or have it ruled in order on the floor. My assumption is, is that when we left the subcommittee with Mr. Ross, we had improved our understanding of positions and what was possible. Uh, I am just as dedicated to do it here. But uh, I wanted to personally thank you for the work you did of reading the bill, studying the bill, meeting with all the various parties, and, and coming up with real-world solutions that are going to help us a lot. And I, I yield back. I guess there is more discussion on this one amendment. Mr. Lynch. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I am going to be uh, quite brief. I simply want oh. to uh, <laughs> express support for the Cummins Amendment, and I do so particularly in three areas. I am very pleased that it protects the collective bargaining rights of workers that it provides for refunding the overpayment of the retiree pension benefits, and it creates a chief innovation officer to look for and at other ways of generating revenue and more effectively doing business for the Postal Service. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Now the, uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, is recognized. Thank you very much. I want to associate myself with the remarks of uh, my mentor on this committee, uh, Mr. Davis of Illinois. Uh, I do want to — I know I am a, a co-sponsor of this bill, but uh, the gentleman from Maryland is really the, the, the engine of, of this initiative, and I am, I am merely the caboose. Uh, one, two, two of the sections I would like to point out that I think are extremely innovative and uh, and thoughtful. One is the treatment of uh, any incentive, uh, early retirement incentive payment uh, regarding the, the thrift uh, savings plan where that, any of those resources could be uh, received by a retiree in, in the thrift savings plan and better allowing them to, to uh, prepare for retirement. Uh, and secondly, uh, in Section 203 of, of Mr. Cummings' bill, uh, it instructs the Office of Personnel Management to devise a sensible and realistic payment timetable for uh, covering retiree health benefits. So it, uh, it does address that, that issue uh, in a way that avoids that uh, periodic payment that we see at now that is uh, bankrupting uh, the Postal Service. So I want to commend him for, for those sections and for the entire bill. And, uh, and just say that I fully support uh, the gentleman's amendment. I yield back. Would the gentleman yield to the gentleman from Virginia? Of course. Gentleman from Virginia. I thank the chair and I thank my colleague. Um, I just want to respond to Mr. Meehan. Uh, I, I think his remarks were very heartfelt. And as somebody relatively new here, I share his frustration. Uh, and I would say to him that I, what I would really like to see here is a debate about the framework. I think what we have is two competing frameworks. Um, and, and I wish uh, we could maybe take the politics out of it so that there was a fair exchange and Democratic ideas had the same chance as Republican ideas, because what are those, really? And, but I do think there is a genuine philosophical difference, and it is not partisan, because I think you are going to see that on the floor. If this bill comes to the floor, there are going to be Republicans as well as Democrats who are going to have a different point of view. Uh, we ought to be debating what the best way is to try to make sure we are saving postal service for the constituents we serve and, and in, in, in keeping uh, our commitment to the constitutional provision for postal service in Article I. Um, and so uh, I, I, I really just want to let my colleague know you are not alone in, in expressing the frustration you have. And I wish we could find a vehicle we did not in this bill where we could actually find common ground and try putting aside partisanship and political agendas, look at what is the best solution to the problem at hand. And I pledge to Mr. Meehan, if you are willing to do that, certainly this member is as well. And I yield back. 
Seeing no further, uh, those, uh, why wishing the, no further people wishing to speak uh, on the amendment, the, uh, the question uh, arises, all those in favor of the amendment by Mr. Cummings, say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. In the opinion of the chairs, the nays have it, the nays have it. A recorded vote is requested. Pursuant to the rule, the vote will be rolled. Thank you. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just uh, of course. Any idea of when we may have recorded votes? When I, I we, only ask because yeah. I have another markup as well. Uh, and I, and I'd like I answered at the beginning, but I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, at the at the conclusion of all amendments, our intention is to, and we'll try to give notice as we wind down. Our our intention is to bring everyone back for that vote, then go through the next two bills. If the ranking member uh, feels that we need to go into the next bill in order to allow more time. In other words, if we at the end suddenly find ourselves with no more amendments, then I can use the other two bills to create a window of time because I want every member to have an opportunity to be here. And that is what is really good about the rolled vote. So I can assure the gentleman, as long as you are still on campus, you will be able to get back here in plenty I, of time. I, I thank the Chair. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else wish to offer an amendment? Uh, Mr. Ross? Mr. Chairman, I do have allowed by law on male classes whose revenues do not cover their costs, a calculation that is inflated by the excess capacity that the United States Postal Service itself has acknowledged exists. If we know there are at least 200,000 excess USPS employees and 250 more mail processing facilities than are needed to process current mail volumes, I believe it is only reasonable to allow the rest of our bill to work and remove excess costs in advance of any rate increase that could drive even more mail out of the system and exacerbate the problems at the United States Postal Service. Across the periodical industry, the surcharge would cost $100 million in additional postage a year. They could not absorb that additional cost, and tough decisions would have to be made regarding layoffs and increased costs to consumers for magazine and catalog subscriptions. My amendment takes a reasonable approach. It delays the implementation of any rate increase. In two years, if any class of mail still does not cover its costs, a rate increase would go into effect. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. And would the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Uh, the Chair is, is prepared to accept this common sense amendment. Uh, we find that, in fact, uh, there is considerable question about what the true price of periodic and other discounted mail would be uh, if the efficiencies that we strive to achieve over the next two, two years are. And I thank the gentleman for coming up with a, a middle ground solution that allows us to first find out how much before we begin making those adjustments, other than, and I want to make it clear, uh, my understanding of your bill is in no way does it stop this, the consumer price index increases that may occur, so it doesn't put the post office at a competitive disadvantage. C correct. Correct. I thank the gentleman. I yield back. Anyone? Uh, the gentlelady from New York is recognized to speak on the amendment. I, uh, I, I, I move to strike the last word, and I am. The gentlelady is recognized. I'm concerned about the underlying bill, and had hoped that we'd achieve a, a, a bipartisan bill to report to the full House, and, and I. Uh, support Mr. Cummings' amendment and, and, and other efforts by Mr. Lynch. But I am uh, very grateful to uh, my colleague, Mr. Ross from Florida, for offering this uh, amendment, which would address a potentially job-killing uh, provision in the base bill that would be especially harmful uh, to um, workers in the district that I represent in New York City. Uh, the, we, the newspaper, and the, not the newspaper, but the magazine industry is, is basically a trillion-dollar private sector mailing industry that relies on the Postal Service and supports 8 million jobs. 
uh, many of, of which are in my district. Uh, they, many of the magazine publishing uh, industry is headquartered there. Uh, Time, uh, Hearst, Condé Nast, uh, important magazines such as U.S. News and World Report, Newsweek, Time Magazine, Glamour, Cosmo. But regretfully, many magazines have been closing because of the, the, the cost of mailings, many important magazines. So this would, would, uh, would allow two more years for, for them to adjust uh, uh, the reforms at the Postal Service so that uh, these reforms could hopefully cover uh, the cost of the periodicals and would not uh, have to have a, a rate increase. And the uh, Ross Amendment, I think, takes a very reasonable approach. It delays the implementation of any rate increase on periodicals and other so-called underwater classes of mail until the Postal Service has had time to remove excess costs from the system. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate uh, uh, really his addressing the 5 percent surcharge um, on mail classes, uh, which would have hurt the overall business model of, of, of magazines and, and had a uh, very negative effect on jobs, uh, the ability for this industry to grow and expand. It is an important uh, bill. It is an important amendment. It will save jobs. It will uh, help our industry. And as we look at creating jobs and ways to grow jobs in our country, let us also look at ways we can save jobs, jobs that are already there. And that is what this amendment does. It is an important one. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support it. And I yield back the balance. Would the gentlelady yield? Absolutely. Uh, I would like to recognize the gentlelady for the words that you have said today and, and how you have dealt with uh, a, uh, an important part of the industry that you have represented so well and, and made the point repeatedly to many of us on both sides uh, that we want to make sure that there, this remains healthy, because ultimately it is not just a business, it is also part of our democracy to ensure that the ideas in those periodicals get to all of us. So thank you again for your leadership and yield back. Thank, thank you for your statement, and I, I appreciate it. Uh, and, and to my good friend, Danny Davis. Thank you very much. And I simply want to uh, support the Ross Amendment and also commend you for the years of work that you have done in behalf of all of those uh, magazine publishers in New York and other places throughout the country. And I yield back. Thank you, Danny. General Lady Yield. Absolutely. I uh, just want to uh, join the chorus here in terms of uh, supporting Mr. Ross's amendment. He does good work. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Does the gentlelady yield back? I yield back. Thank I you. I thank the gentlelady. Uh, as no further members are seeking recognition, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by Mr. Ross. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes certainly have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The chair now recognizes. Oh, okay. uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I believe I have an amendment in the nature of a substitute at the desk. Uh, in an amendment in the amendment amendment to the amendment in the nature of the substitute. Correct. The clerk will designate the amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Substitute for the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309, offered by Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts. I will ask unanimous consent to be, the bill be considered, the amendment be considered as read. Without objection, the Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we undertake the critical duty of modernizing the United States Postal Service, I think it is important that we do so with due diligence and in the spirit of bipartisanship that the, the good employees of the United States Postal Service deserve. Uh, regrettably, I think the proposal offered by the majority with several drastic and destructive provisions do not reflect the bipartisan agreement and, and fall well short of that, uh, that goal. In contrast to H.R. 2309, I offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute that addresses those key areas where we have found a significant degree of consensus between the Postal Service, the Postal stakeholders, and members of, the con members of Congress from both sides of the aisle. I have uh, on this bill, I have uh, I believe 235 uh, co-sponsors, including uh, 30 of my friends uh, from the Republican side of the aisle. Uh, first of all, this amendment addresses the estimate, estimated overpayment of between $50 billion and $75 billion made by the Postal Service into the CSRS, Civil Service Retirement System Fund, and transfers this surplus to the Postal Service Retiree Health Benefit Fund. 
Notably, this overpayment has resulted from the inequitable actuarial formula used by the Office of Personnel Management to calculate the share of retirement benefit costs between the Federal Government and the Postal Service for postal employees who serve both as uh, employees under the taxpayer-funded post office, that was prior to 1971, and also the postage ratepayer-funded United States Postal Service that exists today. Uh, I know that several of, of the members have, res uh, that have uh, mentioned the GAO report that came out, which uh, says that the, the calculation by OPM was within Federal law. I just want to just point out to those members who may not have read the, the GAO report, uh, I would refer them to the response of the Office of the Inspector General for the United States Postal Service. I think that offers a very good summary of the failings of the GAO uh, report in this regard. I have enormous respect for Gene Dodaro uh, over at uh, GAO. Uh, however, this is not his best work. And uh, I think that the report here is, is terribly flawed. Uh, for instance, the report fails to recognize how the 2003 law uh, changed the 1974 law, which initially uh, carved out the differences between the obligations of the Postal Service today and, and, uh, and the Postal Service as it existed before 1971. In, uh, in 2003, the Congress uh, deleted the language. We basically removed a provision um, regarding the allocation of, of obligations for uh, this pension fund. And despite the, the deletion by Congress, uh, the GAO report says that uh, there was essentially no change by Congress. It, it, it blows my mind. We, we completely deleted the section regarding the, the allocation of obligations in 2003, but, but the GAO report is saying that we took no action to change it. We completely deleted it from the bill. And uh, <clears throat> I, I also think it's, it's, it's uh, instructive that uh, the formula that has been used for, for retiree health benefits for Federal employees who work for the Post Office and work for the Federal Government, and for cost of living adjustments for people who work for the Postal Service before it, when it was a taxpayer-funded entity. And today, the formula that is used in both those cases is years of service. They treat years of service for the Postal Service as it exists today and the Federal Government as the Postal Service existed prior to 71. They treat them the same for those benefits. In this case, however, it requires the Postal Service to pay 70 percent of the cost for that employee's retirement. So an employee who works 15 years for the Federal Government when it was run by the, excuse me, 15 years for the Postal Service when it was run by the Federal Government and 15 years under the current ratepayer. Uh, post service, which is paid for by stamps and by postal fees, that employee's pension would be paid, even though they worked e he worked equally, he or she worked equally for, for both entities, under the current formula, the Postal Service would pay 70 percent of that retiree's benefits. The Federal Government, which had that employee for half the time, would pay 30 percent. That is what we are talking about here. The GAO report does not adequately uh, address that. Uh, in addition, uh, if the gentleman could summarize. Oh, sure. How am I doing on time? You are 20 seconds, seconds over okay. so far. Okay. Uh, this, we would also use the, the overpayment that is acknowledged. We have had two studies done on the, uh, the, the pension piece. Uh, we have also got an overpayment of about $6.9 billion by the Postal Service on the FERS, the Federal Employee Retirement System. We would use that to move uh, postal, senior postal uh, employees into retirement with, uh, with an early retirement incentive. And that would reduce the workforce by about 100,000 people 
and, and give us some breathing space to incorporate some of the, the other changes, structural changes that, that we need to adopt to put the Postal Service on a firm footing going forward. So uh, I am sure my time has expired. I want to uh, thank the gentleman uh, for his courtesy once again. Thank you. Uh, of course, your passion and your knowledge on this subject needs to be heard by all of us. With that, I recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Burkle, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just have a few brief comments. First of all, I was one of the uh, Republicans who signed on to the gentleman's bill uh, from Massachusetts. Uh, thank you. And I, uh, I thank you for your efforts. We had several meetings in the district with postal workers and, and their concern. And really, we really were looking for a way to resolve this issue and seemed that your bill was a reasonable approach. However, in the meantime, this GAO study has, has come out, and these numbers are so different than what we were basing our, uh, our decision to support your bill. Now we have got a completely different set of facts. And so it seems like until we can determine if you know, I tend to rely on the GAO, and I understand you are maybe disputing how they came up with that number. But it seems like this issue should be set aside until, until and unless we can verify and come up to some agreement. But in the meantime, we should be more concerned with resolving this process, making sure we are we're, uh, we're reforming and, and doing what we need to do to keep this system viable. And, uh, and, and because it is bipartisan, everyone wants the Postal Service to survive people in our districts, seniors living in the rural areas, the postal workers. It is the best thing to do. But I think if we have got now a, a change in facts that we base the decision to uh, support your bill, it, it really um, merits that we step back. Well, uh, would the gentlelady, would the gentlelady yield? yield? Gentlelady. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the gentlelady both for uh, her words now and, and for her signing on to a bill with the numbers that were known at the time that were there. Uh, we all like the GAO reports that support the opinions we may already have had. And, we all find some fault when it doesn't happen. But I, I just want to quickly provide some, some balance here. And there's three points of balance. First of all, the CBO in 2003 would have had to score $45 billion of cost to the bill had they, in other words, had we recognized that that was the case, as the gentleman from Massachusetts suggests. I do not believe, even in those spendthrift days of 2003-2004, that $45 billion would have gone unnoticed as a cost. Secondly, and this is probably the, the very important point that we all understand, and the gentlelady from New York is, uh, is like me, both a, is a parent and a child, but also, unlike me, you have got grandkids, many of them. During the intervening years from 1974 and from 2003, the rate payers paid the premium necessary to pay in this money. If we were to assume that somehow this was not supposed to be paid in, how do we give back 300 million Americans their refunds? Because they overpaid. Had, in fact, we been operating in 74 and 2003 at a lower rate, the rates would have had to have been set so that, in fact, the periodicals, the nonprofits, mom, pa, wouldn't, wouldn't have that. Lastly, and I said there were three points, and this is the one that uh, Ms. Burkle, as a grandmother, will appreciate the most. If we simply have a program to give that money back today, it doesn't mean that the bill won't come due. People will retire. There is no question about the long-term cost. It is only about whether or not this pot of money is used today and then when it comes due, hope that there will be money there. So although I share the gentleman's concern that we find the monies necessary to right-size the post office, and I will work with the gentleman from Massachusetts to find the money to do the buyouts and the reorganizations necessary, I think the gentlelady's point is the number that has been determined by GAO, the number that was scored by CBO back in 2003, is unequivocally affirmed to be the number we should use for purposes of what is available to this committee today. And I thank the gentlelady and, and yield back to her. Will the gentlelady yield? Absolutely. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I, you know, I think there are, there are two very, very good studies, one by the Hay Group uh, that reviewed the CRS, CSRS liability and also the Siegel Company. Those are two very, very good reports that support the position that I have taken, uh, 
I have also read the GAO report, and I, I find it lacking, honestly, uh, especially with the precedents that are, that are laid out. Um, so I, I understand the diligence with which uh, the gentlelady has approached this, and I appreciate that. And, and uh, I, I would just say that uh, if, if you looked at the, the detail in those reports and the analysis that they used, it is clear that, uh, that the the Postal Service has overpaid. And this is not the first time they have overpaid. We have had other instances where the gentlelady's time has expired. Where uh, the I Postal Service back. has Th Thank you. The gentlelady yield yields back. back. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for five minutes. Uh, can I, in, in part of this recognition, may I just take a moment, Mr. Chairman? I shared with the gentlelady the concern and signed on to your bill on the basis of that OPM report. As a former prosecutor, now I am seeing the difficulty that last night we get touched again with something not, this is the GAO, with really experts who, who are giving us very defined, specific reasons for why they disagree. And my quick reading of it suggested that there were some factors that are quite legitimate in the GAO study. So I, I share with Ms. Burkle, I mean, I, I want to try to find a way, if in fact those dollars are owed, to allow them to be appropriately utilized. But when you get a GAO report that comes in and, and has taken into consideration the Hay study and the information that was gained, we need the ability to determine who is right here. But the difficulty is, as of today, the difficulty is supporting something in which it has been so clearly, uh, so clearly uh, changed from the perspective of the, uh, the, the reports. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is this my moment to talk about my amendment? Uh, this, this, this you, will, you will have a moment shortly. Okay. Well, you are welcome you. to talk, but. No, no, no I would rather. I, would, I want to focus on this particular yeah. issue. So that is, Mr. Lynch, that, that is the issue before I share with Ms. Burkle. I signed on to your bill. Well, I let, wanted to let, find that. Will the gentleman please yield? Yes, I will yield. Okay, yes. thank you. I know that uh, the gentleman and, and the gentlelady are relatively new uh, to the committee, but uh, the GAO report reveals nothing new. This is not new. Uh, OPM and, and, and GAO have maintained that position. It is not uncommon for the GAO to side with the administration's position. It is, you know, that is not, not uncommon. Uh, I have a special uh, respect for the current uh, uh, GAO uh, director, and uh, you know, I think he's a fine man. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is there are several, I think, independent sources of analysis that one could look to that have a greater level of credibility than the GAO on this point. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, as far as the overpayment goes and where that money might go, uh, well, the gentleman, cust you'll customers back for one of the second. Postal I, I... Service uh, would, the, the monies paid to the Postal Service were paid to sustain the Postal Service. That is why customers paid in. It is running at a, a terrible deficit, and there is a gap in the funding. And uh, to, the, to the Chairman's point, uh, second point, where that money would go would be exactly where the customer intended it to go, which would be to sustain the Postal Service going forward. I yield back. Well, thank, thank you. the gentleman. I yield back. Would the gentleman further yield to me? To me? Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll yield. I thank the gentleman. And in support of, of your statement, after the GAO report came out, Senator Carper, one of the Democratic uh, authors on uh, the other side of the Capitol, said, and he has been a longtime proponent of postal reform, in the Washington Post uh, said uh, uh, he is not, well, the Washington Post reports he is agreeing with ISA and calling on lawmakers to table discussion of CSRS refunds and to focus instead on areas of agreement, including paying back the $6.9 billion from the FERS. Uh, I know that there may be nothing new in the GAO report, but I do believe that uh, it does a very good job of affirming uh, a position that, uh, that now becomes the base for uh, decisions on financing in this text. And I just want, if I may quickly, uh, first of all, I would like to ask unanimous consent that today's out off the press's GAO report on post will be officially placed in the record without objection so ordered. Uh, it does say in that report, uh, and I will quote, some have referred to overpayments by the United States Postal Service has made to CSRS fund, 
which can imply an error of some type, mathematically, or actuarially, or accounting. We have not found evidence of error of these types. While the United States Postal Service, uh, Office of Inspector General, and uh, the PRC reports make judgments about fairness in the 1974 Act, they find, and it goes on, they find no inconsistency in that. So one might say the 1974 Act was unfair. And if we grab the members who were here in 1974, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Dingell, they might say so. But in 1974, this Congress, under Democratic control, passed a bill in which the language is clear. And I think that's, that's the area in which we don't have debate. Uh, again, I want to thank Mr. Meehan for, uh, for working so hard on some amendments that will be coming up in a few minutes, because, in fact, you are making this bill better in every possible way that we, we know how. And I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I now Mr. recognize Chairman. the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I am going to, uh, in a moment, I want to yield to Mr. Lynch, but I want to ask Mr. Lynch a question real quick. Uh, and then I will yield to you. David Williams, uh, on October 11th, the Inspector General, uh, in response to the GAO report, said these words, and I just want your, 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 your response on this. He said, The current OPM methodology is neither fair nor modern, nor does it comply with the 2003 law. We agree with you that action from Congress is necessary to settle this issue once and for all. We believe Congress did just that in 2003. If OPM cannot be convinced of the need to change its methodology, the only alternative is for Congress to compel OPM to act by adding even more explicit reform language to the legislation currently being prepared. Uh, that is from the IG. And I just want your response, and uh, I will yield back to the gentleman. And I support the amendment. Thank you. I thank the ranking member. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask, uh, just, just to make this discussion on the record in response to the ranking member's question, I would ask that the, the uh, letter from uh, the Office of the Inspector General addressed to Ms. Lorelei St. James, October 11, 2011, be uh, entered into the record. And, and without objection. I believe it is a part of the report, but without objection it will be uh, uh, entered separately. Okay. Thank you. Uh, to, to the gentleman's point, uh, he is exactly right. The, the report of the GAO ignores the fact that the law changed in 2003. It ignores the fact that the methodology used by OPM to calculate this pension benefit is different than the way they calculate the health care uh, benefit uh, formula and the cost of living formula. Usually, for one employee, benefits are usually calculated with the same dynamic formula. As workers get older, as wages increase, uh, there, is, there are uniform changes to the way that employee is, is treated and the way the, the obligations uh, to that employee are calculated. In this case, it is different. In this case, the formula being used by OPM is a static, uh, uh, archaic formula, whereas the ones for that same employee on health benefits and on COLA are dynamic. So uh, the, the opinion of the GAO, uh, with all due respect, uh, basically ignores those facts. And I think that uh, the points that have been raised in the Hay study and in the Siegel uh, studies are, are on point and, and much more, uh, I think, uh, fine-tuned to, to what the problems are with the current CSRS uh, overpayment. I also think, to be quite frank, that the number uh, $50 billion to $75 billion owed by the Federal Government, I think that the GAO is very nervous about that. I think that the the Office of Personnel Management is very nervous about that, and they don't want to be facing that obligation that has accumulated over time. But uh, it is what it is, and it is an overpayment, whether they want to call it that or not. Uh, and, and those, uh, those overpayments are due to the United States Postal uh, Service employees. I agree. I yield, uh, back. I yield back. I yield to the uh, gentleman from Illinois. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Ranking Member. And I simply want to indicate support for the Lynch uh, Amendment. It reflects a tremendous amount of analytical thought and study over a number of years that I am familiar with. I think it is a good amendment, and I support it. And I yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. I will recognize myself to, uh, to strike the last word. Uh, you know, some time ago, we, when we were meeting in the subcommittee, uh, this was debated uh, rather intensely. And, and by both sides, I think that we, we were both well grounded in our opinions as to the existence of an overpayment. Well grounded so much that we realized that in order to resolve this issue, we had to reach out to some agency or some institution that we would trust. And as a result of that, a bipartisan, bicameral letter was sent out, me on it, the chairman, the ranking member, the ranking member of the subcommittee sent out to the Government Accounting Office, because at that time we believed that the Government Accounting Office maybe should have the last word on this issue. And the GAO in their report were asked to determine whether OPM's current methodology for allocating responsibility for CRS, CSRS benefits between the United States Postal Service and the federal, federal Government is consistent with the law, the analysis used by the Postal Service, OIG, NPRC to conclude that OPM should refund the contributions. Three, the potential impact such a refund would have on a refund, and four, the potential impacts that a refund would have on the United States Postal Service's financial outlook. Well, today we have that report, and it comes as no surprise that those of us who relied on this report are going to have to live and die by this report. What concerns me is that the report, as comprehensive as it is, makes findings that there is no that the, me the payment methodology is correct. The report states, the current methodology used by OPM for allocating responsibility for the CSRS payments between UPS and the Federal Government is consistent with applicable law. Furthermore, it goes on to remove that it would cost taxpayers, for removal of any funds would cost taxpayers an estimated $55 to $85 billion. This liability would then have to be funded by the Federal Government using tax revenue or borrowing. Well, I also want to point out on page 22 of the report that the GAO did consider the 2003 law in making their comments. So what I am submitting to this committee is that I believe that all contingencies considered at the time and considered today were vested in the inquiries made by the bipartisan members of Congress to the GAO requesting final resolution on this. And the decision for some is very difficult. Believe me, I. I, I was willing to live by the results of this decision and still am willing to live by the results of this decision. But we need to move on from whether there exists some um, overpayment, that there is no basis in law or fact, and move on with the initiatives that we are being charged with, and that is the systemic reformation of one of the greatest institutions this country has ever had. And so I would urge my colleagues to vote against this amendment. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yield? Yeah. Yield, yes, sir. I, I thank the gentleman. And I, and I, I don't disagree with the, the premise with which we submitted the question. Uh, I expected a, a response from the GAO that was grounded in law. And I don't see that. that that's what troubles me. That's, that's, what, that's what I was hoping for, and we didn't get it on this side. It, it was not a requirement that they agree with me, but it, it was the expectation that they would uh, lay forth the argument in a way that, that I, is consistent with law, and I, and I just don't, don't see that. Let me, let me just close by saying I understand, that, I understand the gentleman's position. And, uh, and yes, there was, a, there was a commitment, I think, from both sides to, to put this to the GAO uh, for, for a third opinion. Uh, I would add that also within my amendment there is a provision for allowing members of Congress to be part of any closure process for any postal services, uh, postal facilities in our districts. And uh, before a vote is taken on this amendment, I just want the members to know that I have asked that, that the 435 members of Congress and 100 members of the Senate be part of any potential closings uh, that occur in their district so that they would have input. 
uh, that is one aspect of my amendment that has not been uh, discussed here today. So uh, with that, I appreciate the courtesy given to me by, by the Chairman, and I yield back. In reclaiming my time, um, the, the gentleman from Massachusetts has had some, some very good ideas that I think that will continue to be um, um, bantered back into and most likely incorporated at the end of the day in some of these, but for the, uh, the overpayment issue. Are there any other members uh, wishing to speak on this amendment? Uh, seeing none, the question is on the amendment by Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All the opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the Chair, the noes have it. Roll call vote has been requested. Thank you. Uh, a recorded vote on the amendment by Mr. Le uh, by Mr. Lynch will be postponed until the further pursuant to further committee rules. Mr. Connolly. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. So, Mr. Chairman. Oh. Uh, in, in in keeping with our. Um, our system here, we are going to go back to the, the side for theirs, and then we will come back to you. Of course. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Utah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309, offered by Mr. Chaffetz of Utah. The gentleman from Utah is recognized for five minutes. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask you to ask consent to have the amendment considered as read. Uh, seeing no objection. Oh, God. Okay. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I view the, uh, the Postal Service as one of the great institutions uh, and competitive advantages for the United States of America. Uh, I also view it uh, as a tool of commerce. It is a competitive advantage to the United States of America to be able to move goods and communications, checks and all sorts of other things in a very timely and efficient manner. It is still amazing to me that uh, you can put a stamp on something and here in, uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, and then uh, have it arrive in, in uh, Elmo, Utah, uh, in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, that is absolutely amazing to me. I am very concerned, though, about Section uh, 111, uh, 111 in the uh, underlying bill. Um, and what this amendment does is it moves to strike that section out and replace it. Primarily, we are dealing with the, uh, the move and the desire by some to move from six-day delivery to five-day delivery. And what I'm trying to do with this amendment here is give some flexibility to the Postal Service so that there are certain times, and I, we've, in this amendment we've designated 12, that the Postal Service may up to 12 days a year designate uh, a non-delivery day. I'm sure there's some errant uh, day in uh, Tuesday or a Friday or whatever it might be in August uh, where it would be appropriate to maybe have a non-delivery day. But I am concerned about extracting 52 days out of the year and have those be deemed as non-delivery days, whether they be periodicals or newspapers or they may be um, medicines that are traveling through. Or uh, There are so many, an infinite number of reasons why I think we would miss, as a nation, uh, that extra day of delivery. I also think it is impractical to suggest that we are going to eliminate a Saturday before Mother's Day or the Saturday before you know, the, the, the Christmas holiday or something like that, I think would make it exceptionally difficult on the Postal Service. So this gives some flexibility to the Postal Service to designate up to 12 uh, non-delivery days, while at the same time um, making sure that we don't move from six-day to five-day as a permanent structure. I disagree with the President, quite frankly. I disagree with those that believe that this would be a, a great way to, to, to save money. The Postal Service has high fixed costs. It has capacity and volume. And I think I continue to believe that one of the major challenges facing the Postal Service is how do they become more relevant? How do we actually move and push volume through this massive system? That is what we ought to be doing. And when, so when the Postal Service comes back and says, well, we have got to lessen the service and raise the rates, that is not going to drive volume through the system. And yet that ought to be the driving focus of what we do, because the way we get back to self-sufficiency here, the way we make this the most viable tool that we have is to move volume through the system. You don't do that by raising rates and cutting services. So that is my concern. Now, this uh, amendment does allow the PRC to go back and do an analysis and would give some flexibility. Depending on the economic analysis there, we count and rely heavily on them to do their job. But I, uh, I, do, I am opposed to moving from 
six-day to five-day delivery. And I would hope we could find some bipartisan support uh, for this amendment. And uh, with that, at uh, this moment, I will yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Illinois is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I am going to say to the gentleman from Utah that he just found some. <laughs> I certainly don't want to see us lock in a five-day delivery system. And I think that the gentleman from uh, Utah has come up with an idea that provides a level of flexibility, but also provides a level of opportunity. And if the need would continue to exist, then this is a tool that postal management would have at its disposal to try and reach a point of viability. I think it is a good idea, and I commend the gentleman for it, and I support it. And yield back. The gentleman yields back. Any other members wish to speak on the amendment? Seeing none, the question is now on the amendment by the, offered by the gentleman from Utah. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. Are there other, the, the amendment passes. Are there other amendments at the desk? Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Missouri. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Mr. Clay of Missouri. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the amendment, amendment be considered as read. Without objection, the Thank gentleman you. from Missouri is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move for the adoption of the amendment. Uh, I offer this amendment to strike section 702 because I think the section does not do what it purports to do. I think it is designed to undermine the U.S. Postal Service and, more importantly, to undermine our postal workers who every day provide the mail to millions of Americans. I think this section is not about competition but about replacing U.S. postal workers with non-union contractors. It is about outsourcing jobs that should be performed by postal workers, punitive outsourcing designed to weaken the Postal Service and especially the post Postal Workers Union. Uh, there is an anti-union sentiment mostly aimed at public sector unions among some who, who believe uh, that destroying unions will improve our economy. Uh, those who believe that are incorrect. These attacks on unions will have the opposite effect. Uh, workers have a right to bargain collectively for fair wages and benefits, and unions ensure that right. Labor unions def defend the vital interests of workers and their families promote social justice and the common good, and strengthen our nation. This section does not promote competition, and I think it is unnecessary in the scope of the rest of the, the title. Uh, little by li little, Mr. Chairman, this bill undermines the U.S. Postal Service. It, it chips away at the most important part of the system, and that is our postal workers. And I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and strike Section 702. I recognize myself to speak in opposition to the amendment. Uh, right now, there are no statutory requirements that, that uh, uh, mandate that there be a competitive uh, uh, criteria in any of the contracting uh, with, with the Postal Service. This particular uh, section uh, that this amendment seeks to eliminate would require that uh, the private sector, if, the, if, if a function can be formed performed by the private sector well or better and at lower cost, promoting competition to the maximum extent practical, consistent with obtaining best value and, re and reviewing procurement activities, then those contracts ought to be let. I believe that when we are making systemic reforms of this institution, that we have to look at what is in the best interest not only of the institution, 
but also those who are its vendors and those who are servicing it. Competition breeds this efficiency, it breeds this effectiveness, and it will breed, breed its cost effectiveness. Uh, therefore, I would uh, request my colleagues to vote against this amendment. Chairman. The, the gentleman from Illinois is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I won't be redundant, but I will just associate myself with the remarks of Mr. Clay. I think that, again, his amendment is designed to protect the rights that workers have fought long and hard over many years, decades, even centuries. I don't want to see that eroded, and I think the gentleman has an excellent amendment, and I support it. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. I thank my friend from Illinois. I wish to join uh, with him in his remarks. I think Mr. Clay's amendment is an important amendment. Again, we are presented in this bill with a false choice. Somehow, because of the uh, falling economic status of the Postal Service, we have no choice but to, in fact, eviscerate hard-won workers' rights, including collective bargaining, in order to put the Postal Service right. That is not true. That is not a choice we have to make. And, in fact, it is one we should reject. So I thank my colleague from uh, Missouri uh, for his thoughtful amendment, and I intend to support it. Gentle the gentleman yields back. Thank you. Are, are there any other members wishing to speak on the amendment? Mr. Seeing none, the question is now. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I the gentleman, may, yeah, the gentleman may from Missouri. I, may, may I close on the amendment by sharing uh, with the committee a story about my postal person who delivers my mail every day, uh, Mr. Bryant. Uh, Mr. Bryant is a young man that has been featured on local uh, television uh, news stories uh, for his expediency in delivering the mail. He averages finishing uh, his task uh, daily between 12 noon and 2 p.m. Uh, and they have highlighted him uh, sprinting from house to house, uh, jumping over hedges. And the people in my neighborhood in St. Louis are, are, are very pleased with their delivery and the service that they get from Mr. Bryant. Uh, I am very pleased with it. Uh, and, and Mr. Bryant exemplifies the heart and soul and the spirit of the Postal Service workforce uh, that we should be supportive of, that we should be uh, be, be behind uh, totally. And uh, therefore, Mr. Bryan is caught up in his work. He loves his work. He loves his service to his community. Uh, and, and, and we shouldn't uh, decimate that soul and that spirit of the American postal worker. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I ask for the adoption of the amendment. As no mem further member seeking recognition, the question is on agreeing to the amendment by the gentleman from Missouri. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, chairman, the no's that, have it. The I'd gentleman like from Missouri. I ask for the, the yeas and nays. Uh, the, the gentleman from, from Missouri requests a recorded vote on the amendment. Uh, such, amendment will be postponed, uh, such a vote will be postponed uh, pursuant to the committee rules. Uh, the gentlewoman from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Ms. Burkle of New York. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent that that be entered into the record without the reading of the bill. Without objection, the gentlelady from New York is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment, Mr. Chairman, um, allows that only 10 percent of the post office closings um, come from rural post office. As I have listened to my constituents throughout the course of the debate regarding the post office and how we will resolve some of the issues, so many of the constituents who live in rural areas are concerned that the post office closings um, in a rural area would severely impact uh, their, their connection with the community. And also, uh, for seniors, it really is the anchor for them in uh, in their towns, in their small towns in the district. For many uh, in my district, and I am sure for many other members, um, 
the members and their constituents in rural areas, travel is measured not in, in blocks but in miles. And um, many of these folks need their post office. It's, it's the only way they can connect with their community. And so I would ask my colleagues to support this amendment that would limit the number of uh, closures of post office to 10 percent in rural areas. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back. Mr. Mr. Connolly, you are recognized. Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, I, uh, I rise in uh, vigorous opposition to this amendment. Um, I understand the gentlelady's uh, desire to protect the interest of her rural constituents, but it should not be done at the expense of my suburban and urban residents. Uh, if this amendment were, in fact, to become law, given the magnitude of the post office closures contemplated in this partisan bill, um, we would essentially be voting to close thousands of post offices, irrespective of demand, in suburban and urban areas throughout the United States. Um, there are 36,000 post offices. About 9,200 are in small and rural areas. If we limit the total number of closures, only 10 percent of them can be rural, then we are absolutely guaranteeing we are going to close urban and suburban post offices serving our constituents in a different kind of district. And while I say to my friend from New York, I respect her desire to protect the interest of her, her community, I certainly hope she will respect my desire and that of my colleagues to protect those of ours. And so uh, I, I could never support such an amendment, Mr. Chairman, uh, since it is a direct trade-off, frankly, and it substitutes all of a sudden a decision, political decision, to protect a certain category of postal service, irrespective of any criteria or analysis as to demand, economic viability, uh, or utility or duplication. And I thought the purpose of this bill was to sort of get it right economically. And here we are carving out a major exception that actually throws economic analysis out the window in order to protect a particular uh, part of our constituency. And while I, I, I myself have criticized this bill for what it does to rural areas, this isn't the answer. Starting over again on a bipartisan framework is the answer. Would, will the gentleman yield? I would gladly yield. Thank you very much. Um, the post offices that we are looking at um, protecting, so to speak, are ones that are classified as rural, and we are using the post office standards. And they are ones that really have a very low economic impact on the system. And I, so that is part of this, that they are not high cost locations. They're, they're, they take a minimum amount of money to run these post office. And so the, even if we do close them, it is not going to have that substantial of, a, of an economic impact on what we are trying to do here in streamlining the post office. Um, I, you know, I think the, the real issue is, is in many of these districts, a post office if they close a post office, there may not be a post office for several, several miles further down the road in another town, whereas in the larger cities, there is very likely that there would be a post office four blocks down. Uh, recl reclaiming that. my time, but if I can use it to ask my colleague. I, by the way, I, I agree with the latter part of what she said, and I, I think that is another reason to vote against the ISA bill in front of you. But let me ask my colleague sincerely. If I had a comparable amendment that said no more than 10 percent of any of the post office closures can be in suburban or urban areas, would she support such an amendment? Well, I would have to look at the data. The data that I am basing my amendment on is, is the fact that these, are, these small rural post office really don't, they are not going to have that much of an impact in what we are trying to do here. They are low, uh, low cost. To I thank run my them. colleague and I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Any anyone else? I was just speaking in support of the amendment. Um, interesting, you know, we have our president has made a commitment to see that we have broadband access all across this country, and I I think that's a great uh, uh, aspiration. Uh, but by the same token, I submit that this committee does not want to seek to then, uh, by the uh, other token, uh, eliminate postal service all across this country. And our rural areas who are dependent on this need to make sure that we continue to, to provide our postal service to those facilities. The interesting part about this amendment, in sync with the, uh, the, the, the CPR, the, the um, um, agency that the, the bill creates, would require that post offices look at retail outlets and partnering. And I think what better way to do that than to look at suburban areas 
and rural areas for opportunities to partner with a retail establishment, such as a drug store or a grocery store. And so I think that, that this is a, 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 something that, that is in the right direction. You know, as a member of Congress, it is interesting, we have at least two post offices right here, one in Longworth and, and one in Rayburn. Um, and, and I submit they are probably a couple hundred yards apart from each other. So maybe there might be duplication there. Uh, but in any event, I would urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Are there any other members seeking to speak on this amendment? Seeing none, the question is on the amendment from, from the lady, uh, from gentlelady from New York. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment passes. I would ask for a, I would ask for a recorded vote on that. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Virginia has a request of recorded vote. A recorded vote on the amendment offered by Mrs. Burkle will be postponed pursuant to committee rules. Is there a, other amendments? Jerry, you are recognized for an amendment? I, I think, uh, let me, if I may, Mr. Chairman, yes. inquire whether the gentlelady from D.C. has a, an amendment. Because I think we are going in order of seniority here on our side, and I don't mean to the gentlelady from D.C. is recognized. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, I, was out, I was out because I, I was ranking member on a bill uh, that was in markup until just a minute, ago, a few minutes ago. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a couple of amendments. Okay. Uh, the uh, amendment I have at the desk. Uh, the, the clerk will read the amendment. It's sure. it's uh, H.R. 2309 in the nature of a substitute. One moment. Is there a number on the top left? Ninety-two. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Ms. Norton of the District of Columbia. The gentlelady from the District of Columbia is recognized for five minutes. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, my amendment um, seeks uh, to substitute a sense of the Congress uh, and rescind a truly radical section of this bill uh, that would rescind all prior collective bargaining agreements, including those agreements for reduction in force. Uh, I note that it is uh, through the use of collective bargaining that the Postal Service has already reduced its personnel by 100,000 over just the last four years. Uh, with $12 billion in saving. It would seem uh, that collective bargaining works very well if you want to really downsize without a lot of controversy uh, and get the job done. Uh, we have seen no evidence that collective bargaining won't get the job done. Uh, this rescinding collective bargaining agreement is unprecedented, especially uh, for the Federal Government. It is a precedent we should never set. The uh, alternative of right-sizing at the bargaining table has worked, and I can't imagine why we would not want to continue something that has worked so very well. Uh, in writing my uh, own sense of the Congress, uh, I have uh, purposefully used uh, some of the language that the chairman uh, offered, uh, I believe it was indeed the very last time we met, assuring uh, that any of what he called right sizing uh, would um, uh, assure that the employees, re quote, receive their full pensions and, quote, are fully compensated. Um, my, uh, my sense of the amendment inc incorporates the chairman's language and is surrounded with the following words. It is a sense of Congress that in making determinations that affect prior collective bargaining agreements and prior agreements on workforce reduction, any right-sizing effort within the Postal Service that results in a decrease in the number of postal employees should ensure that such employees can receive their full pensions and are fully compensated, and that the collective bargaining agreements and prior agreements on workforce reduction 
that they have entered into with the Postal Service Management are fully honored. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you may get to the point where collective bargaining doesn't work. We haven't got any, anywhere close to that. Uh, I therefore uh, ask that, my, that this First Amendment, Amendment 92, be adopted. The gentlelady yields back. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on the amendment? Is there any objection to the amendment? I want to speak on the amendment. Uh, the, uh, the, the ranking member is recognized. To, the ranking member of the full committee is recognized to speak on the amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the amendment offered by Ms. Norton would add to the amendment in the nature of a substitute a sense of Congress that would state that in making any determinations that affects collecting bargaining agreements, any right-sizing effort within the Postal Service that results in a decrease in the number of postal employees should ensure that such employees can receive their full pensions, are fully compensated, and that the collective bargaining agreements and prior agreements on workforce reduction that they be entered into with the, with the Postal Service management are fully honored. I would hope that Chairman Issa would agree with the sense of Congress, because it actually quotes directly from his statements during the subcommittee markup. And here is what the Chairman said, and I quote, The last thing I want to do is to tell permanent postal workers that we are going to have to abruptly have, to have them leave the service before they can receive their full pension that they anticipated and without any compensation. The intention of this bipartisan bill, and I am continuing to quote, and it will be bipartisan if I possibly can make it, is in fact to make sure that we get a, a, an amount of dollars in savings greater than what it takes to break even, because that creates the revenue that allows for modernization of the fleet and fair compensation to those who are no longer needed in a smaller, more efficient post office, but at the same time, we owe them for their years of service. We owe them a bargain they entered into 15, 20, 30 years ago. End of quote. This amendment simply puts into the bill what the Chairman Issa has said publicly before this committee, and we fully agree with these statements, and we believe we can provide a compassionate path to retirement for postal employees. And we offer that option in a number of amendments today. And so um, I support the gentlelady's amendment. Uh, and with that, I yield to the gentlelady if she has any additional statements. Uh, I, 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 know, uh, uh, I say to the ranking member, I appreciate his uh, support, uh, because uh, in quoting from the chairman's own words, uh, what we have is something tantamount to a promise, and we are going to exhaust our remedies before uh, trying anything like uh, getting rid of, eliminating altogether collective bargaining. And with that, uh, with that I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else willing to, wishing to speak on the amendment? Is there any objection to the amendment? Seeing no objection, should the amendment adopted? Uh, the, the gentleman from Utah is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute off, off, uh, to H.R. 2309 offered by Mr. Chaffetz of Utah. The gentleman from Utah is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I, I, could, I would ask you to ask consent that the amendment be considered as read. W without objection, the gentleman from Utah is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, this is a simple uh, common sense uh, amendment. It, uh, it basically adds in uh, to Section 211 of the bill the term economic savings by uh, adding a definition there that talks about the continuing performance of one or more functions of individuals serving under contractual arrangements of the Postal Service. Certainly our goal and desire on both sides of the aisle is to become more, more effective, more efficient. We have also got to, to get to the, uh, the right uh, uh, cost structure within the Postal Service. There are times, there are places where uh, outside contracts are valuable for the Postal Service as it moves forward. I would also like to highlight uh, for my colleagues this September 19, uh, 2011, um, Office of the Inspector General of the United States Postal Service. Uh, the subject is the audit report. Uh, there, I want to read this uh, particular paragraph. It says, in addition, this is on uh, page 
doesn't have a page number on it, but uh, it's within the report here. In addition to the comparison between city and rural compensation, we also identified the cost for contracted delivery services to both city and rural systems. We found that the cost per delivery for these routes at $0.36 cents was even lower than those for rural routes. Thus, we agree that there are likely additional savings to be gained from transitioning to a more efficient, optimal solution. This amendment simply says that there be a consideration concerning uh, the contractual arrangements as well. Um, and we think that is a valuable part of making sure that the Postal Service has some degree of flexibility and is able to, to achieve the cost savings that it needs. Therefore, I offer this amendment and encourage my member, the members to, uh, to support it. Yield back. The gentleman yields back. Are there other members wishing to speak on this amendment? Seeing none, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Utah. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. The, the gentlelady from D District of Columbia. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a, um, a, a, a final amendment, an amendment that it, it, it takes up some the, of the concerns of the gentlelady who was concerned the clerk about. will the, designate the amendment. It's amendment number 96. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2309 offered by Ms. Norton of the District of Columbia. And the gentlelady from the District of Columbia is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, uh, the amendment it's, uh, is, takes up some of the concerns uh, that the gentlelady uh, who raised the, the problem for rural areas. Now, Mr. Connolly, I think, had the better of that argument because essentially we are dealing with a zero-sum game here. And to deprive um, Peter to pay Paul is, is not a very fair way uh, to go about dealing with isolated communities or communities that would be left without uh, postal service. But we should make every attempt to see to it that there is no community that is left without uh, the most basic of uh, services, such as, for example, the ability to mail uh, parcels. Um, and my amendment uh, goes to how uh, these alternatives would be provided. Uh, first, the amendment requires that the Postal Service make a list of its core services, the most basic of its services that it provides in a community. And then the, the amendment says, and these are very important words, wherever feasible, uh, a, a reasonable, accessible alternative uh, shall be permitted. Uh, and it describes the kinds of alternatives I have in mind. Uh, if we got to the point, and I am assuming that Many of us are fighting to keep uh, postal, postal services open. But I accept the reality that not all of them are going to remain uh, open. So if we get to the point that we are closing uh, postal services, uh, my uh, amendment would have the postal service look to another place of business in the community that is not owned by the postal service but is in close proximity to the post office that has had to be closed or has had to be consolidated so that people in that community can at least uh, get some delivery of their mail or, or, or their parcels, um, uh, do their money orders. These are the very people who are likely not to have uh, not to be able to um, send money in some other way. Now, notice my amendment says where feasible. It, it, it recognizes that this may not be possible all the time. But again, if we don't want to leave hundreds of communities without any postal services, surely it is not too much to ask the Postal Service to make a list of just core, just the most basic, basic services. Uh, look for a retail operation. It could be uh, the corner store, whatever that may be, uh, who might like, by the way, to have the patronage of those who would otherwise have gone to the, to the post office, uh, and let them 
accept the parcels, or I'll let them um, um, uh, um, sell the stamps uh, or whatever postal services that the um, that the U.S. Postal uh, Service says are indispensable to any community. Uh, it is importantly, my amendment would cut all of the overhead of these post offices that some have said are underused, that have to be heated, that have to be air conditioned, that have to that have their own set of upkeep responsibilities. And it doesn't say you got to do this for each and every community. It's, it has a feasibility uh, a section in it. Uh, with that section, I, I hope that there will not be uh, any member that doesn't even want us to make the attempt uh, to try to find some alternative that doesn't cost very much uh, for the Postal Service, but at least leaves uh, some of its cost services available for of people in that particular community. General Lady yields back. I will recognize myself to speak against the amendment. Uh, but part of what this committee is being charged with is to not only give the directions or the schematic for change, but also to give the tools in order to provide those changes. This particular amendment takes away those tools. You see, the Postal Service has a massive brick-and-mortar infrastructure. They have got a network of 32,000 post offices, branches, and stations that have remained largely unchanged over years, despite the declining mail volume and population shifts. This status quo is just untenable. Making it harder to close post offices is a move in the wrong direction. The Postal Service needs to restructure its retail network to meet the changing needs of the 21st century and adjust to declining man demand and to save money. Uh, visits to post offices are declining as customers increase, uh, increasing prefer, increasingly prefer alternatives uh, that are more available uh, more, during more days of the week and longer hours. These alternatives are much more cost effective than the re traditional retail service. We need to make sure that we have empowered our postmaster to make the right business decisions in order to compete in this 21st century with the delivery of the mail. Just listing the number of post offices that need to be closed or should be closed is not going to take us there. Remember, the post office was $10 billion in debt at the la end of this last fiscal year. We need to make sure that these changes are made and they are made appropriately by the postmaster and that he has the appropriate directions and tools to make those. With that, I yield back. Would, would the gentleman yield for a question? Yes. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, not to be argumentative, but I just heard your argument, and yet you just spoke in favor of and voted for Ms. Burkle's amendment which does exactly what you just said we shouldn't do. No, I, I take issue with you. It does not. No, it does not. It, it does it limits. It, 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 it limits. It does, it does not. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, sir. with due respect, it carves out a protected class of post offices irrespective of economic analysis, demand, volume, need, and, and limits it to an artificial 10 percent. I, I disagree with you. It is still required under the, PR, under the, the, the uh, authority to reduce by $1 billion in the first year, irrespective of whether it is 10 percent or 50 percent of rural post offices. What I am addressing here is that we have to make economic decisions in order to reduce the cost of operating this post service. Just listing the names of post offices and not going forward without making those changes economically is not in the best interest of this post office and is what is being promoted by this amendment, merely listing the names. I submit to you that the tools necessary to make these changes have to be part and parcel of the directions. Whether we say it is 10 percent of rural or 20 percent of rural, they still have to make the economic cuts to make it happen. The, the, the ranking member from the full committee. From Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I listen to the argument, um, I must concede that I am totally confused. Now I know how my wife feels. The, um, we talk about tools. We talk about compassion. We talked about people not only having jobs, but putting that aside. We are talking about what Ms. Norton is trying to do is make sure your constituents and mine have a place where they can go to get their mail. And giving the postmaster, as I understand it, another tool, doesn't have to do it, but giving them another tool so that people in, say, the rural areas and areas that where, as one member of Congress told me, that if we close this post office, it's people will now have to go four or five miles to get to a post office. 
Now, I don't live in a rural area. I live in the city, and there are quite a few post offices. And the people in my district don't have to, even if they close a few, and I hope they don't, but if they do, they don't have to go that far. Um, at some point, we have to ask ourselves, um, when we talk about tools, um, and if we're going to put some confidence in, in the postmaster, I think he should be given the kind of tools that will allow him to, as best he can, provide the kind of services within uh, in a, within a re reasonable knowledge from people's houses uh, so that they can still have access to postal services. And I, again, I, th I think it's a good amendment. Um, and again, it's another tool, as you said, uh, to try to, as we try to right size all of this, um, we also, we not only want to right size it uh, for the postal service, but we want to right size it for somebody else who's being left out of this discussion, and that is the uh, 300 plus million people in this country who depend upon the postal service. And so, you know, I just, I, I just, at, at some point, I think, um, you know, tools are very, very important, and people uh, depend upon the mail. And I, and I'm, I just think about some of the people in my district where. The post office is maybe equivalent of a half a mile, maybe a quarter of a mile from the house, and they arrive at the post office today uh, on a Saturday, and they discover that it's already closed early, so they're complaining about that. So when you then, uh, I think that if the postmaster has to close an, an office, and he's got our constituents, by the way, many of them, uh, the them who have come up to me complaining that post offices are going to be moved out of their, their areas, it seems to me that it would be a good option at least for them to be able to say, and I'm talking about members of Congress, because con members of Congress are going to catch hell, um, at least to be able to be in a position to say, okay, we, 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 we had to close your post office, but maybe we can uh, have uh, services in a store or whatever. I, I don't know. What, whatever is feasible makes sense and allow those folks to be able to have service. You know, there is something called, uh, there's one thing to have life. It's another thing to have a quality of life. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, one of the things that we, we concentrate on in Baltimore is trying to make sure that we create what we call livable communities. That is, livable communities where people can easily get around and get things done and, and have certain conveniences. and. So I, I just think that this is a, 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 an effort uh, on the part of the general lady to try to address an issue that, and, that is important to all of us. And it is one that I think it's a, and, and again, she's not trying to force anything on anybody. She's saying, okay, here's a tool that you got in your toolbox. You may not have to use it. You may not find it feasible. You may not. Uh, feel that you need to go this particular route, but um, I think it's reasonable. And I'd, I'd, I'd yield to the general lady if she has something else to say. I, th I thank the ranking member for for his comments, and I certainly thank him for yielding. By voting against this amendment, you would be voting. Don't you would be vote. You would be saying, "I'm not even going to try to find an alternative in case your postal service closes, even if that alternative is." the store you get your provisions uh, every week. I'm not going to try because I'm just out to get the Postal Service uh, done and over with. And given the, the notion that uh, it does not mandate that the Postal Service do anything, but that it make the attempt, at, at, at the attempt to, to, to not leave communities like the rural communities the gentlelady spoke of, uh, like many other communities in urban and suburban communities, a completely bereft of services. We're talking about services that would be available to the elderly, uh, to the disabled, uh, to people who cannot possibly get outside of their communities, uh, people for whom even the, the, the money order section part of the postal services become indispensable to paying their bills. Well, maybe it won't work, but why vote? Uh, why go home and say, 
I voted to not even try to get you an alternative to the postal post office, which I am sure is going to close down in this town because it is on the list. Uh, and I thank the ranking member uh, for yielding. The, gentle, uh, the gentleman from uh, Maryland yields back. Are there any other members wishing to speak on the amendment? The gentlelady from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just briefly, uh, because I offered the amendment, and I just want to make the distinction. My amendment was was to ask that rural post office be taken into consideration. That that may be the only facility for many people who live in rural areas. Whereas uh, the gentlelady from D.C. Um, her her amendment actually limits and and would limit how if if and when we were going to close. Uh, post office facilities. But in urban areas, there are many alternatives. There can be drug stores, grocery stores where we can have those postal services. But those alternatives aren't available in the, in the rural areas. And that's uh, my, my amendment was to take into consideration the fact that we don't want to disadvantage those who live out in rural areas because there may not be any other facility for them to, uh, to use for postal services. Well, Thank you. I yield back. General Lady Lee, I Absolutely. yield back. Uh, Absolutely. My, uh, my, my amendment um, uh, would, would not, in fact, um, um, limit uh, what the Postal, postal, postal Service uh, can do. And the distinction you make between rural communities and communities in big cities, just because I happen to represent a big city, is completely an opposite. Uh, I, I, I am speaking only about, if you look at that list, that list of postal of post offices that be closed, they are in every kind of community across the United States, uh, and it simply bunches all of them together, and it says make a last try, and it says you say there may not be any place in your community. I I don't believe that even in the most isolated rural community there isn't a store or a place where people go to get their uh, provisions like bread and milk. Uh, it seems to me in every part of the United States there is some place where you could say to the store manager, would you mind if they sold stamps here? And I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Thank you. And reclaiming my time, I, I do want to, uh, upstate New York can be very remote in some of those very small towns up there. Uh, there may not be another building or another alternative. And that's what I've heard from my constituents. And it, it isn't something unique to upstate New York, I think, throughout the country. And um, the ranking member mentioned quality of life. And I think protecting some of these rural post offices certainly adds to the quality of life for those folks. I yield back my time. The gentlelady yields back. As no further member seeking recognition, the question is, on agreeing to the amendment offered by Ms. Norton, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the chairs, the noes have it. The noes have it. The, uh, the amendment is not agreed to. At this point, we uh, the gentlelady re requests a recorded vote. Pursuant to the rule, that, that vote will be rolled, uh, postponed, I actually, as officially. For all of you here, uh, when we return from the votes, which should be about half an hour, roughly, we will be going to Mr. Meehan's amendment next. Uh, and what I would suggest is that you come back promptly, because as soon as the proponent of the amendment and two other members are available, we will start. So we are going to try and be as quick as possible. Uh, obviously, it will take a few minutes. With that, we stand in recess. <laughs>